Hello, I'm Ted Mack. Have you ever asked yourself... Can iron poor blood happen to me? Well, check with your doctor. The answer may be yes, especially if you're a woman. You may need iron to change pale iron poor blood into iron rich red blood. And there's no finer, more effective iron tonic in the whole world than Geritol. Geritol iron enters your bloodstream fast, carrying its blood-building power to every part of your body. Just two Geritol tablets or two tablespoons of Geritol liquid contain twice the iron and a whole pound of calf's liver. Get Geritol, America's number one tonic. It builds iron power in your blood. Geritol really works. Yes, friends, Geritol really works. Try it. <laughs> Ten pounds of calf liver. Oh my God! You got me with the Lawrence Welk little send up. That was awesome. That was like just a bonus. Oh God! Yeah, we needed a little Geritol before we came on here. Hey uh, yeah. everybody! Thank you for your patience. My Geritol is the uh, that 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 Spanish blend that I was talking about last week. I decided to crack it open this week. So <laughs> more alcohol than a than a whole pound of calves liver, <laughs> baby. <laughs> I actually wonder a pound of liver could what what's it doing? It's, it's I don't know, but also what is so special about calves liver is a pound of calves liver it's ironing gotten, up your blood man more than a pound of chicken liver or goat liver or cow liver that's a good question actually that's that might be the question of the moment uh, but look uh we have all of our homies chiming in and telling us what they're drinking uh oh hey whoa bemo you got the octomore uh Probably not a lot of people know what that is. That's a uh, is, is is that a brucladi? I've had it uh, in a bottle of that before. It's it's not cheap stuff. It's actually it, it all of those expressions. Their their whole deal is um they are the most heavily peated uh, Scotch whiskeys that you can get. You know the um, the phenol content in um. You know, the, the, seriously, the PPM, the phenol content is through the roof. Like regular, regular Ardbeg and Laphroaig, you know, they're they're typically considered the, the highest PPM content in uh, regular stuff. And, uh, man, I'm backing myself into a corner because I forget what they rate the Octomores at typically. But it's so through the roof above Ardbeg and Laphroaig. But I'll say this, and BMO, you can back me up on this probably. The odd thing is, is that uh, the distillation process is so different at each distillery that, you know, the raw materials that go in may be, you know, the phenol contents through the roof, but it actually doesn't come out being uh, like a more heavily peated expression in terms of the flavor to me than, um, you know, say a regular uh, Laphroaig or an Ardbeg. But that's just me. And I haven't had an Octomore for probably three or four years. But anyhow, hello, Joe. Hello, JS. And thank you for that. Um, uh, this show is prime content for us because you guys come here and help make it so. So you're welcome. What if we were just on here without anybody. <laughs> yeah, really. Dude, what happened to your, your camera? It does that. Oh, oh okay. Just decides <laughs> it gets overloaded with hideousness and just like gives up for a sec <laughs> uh what else do we see here uh michael what were you you mentioned uh the lonely city adventures in the art of being alone i totally don't remember what we were talking about i must have uh drank way too much but that sounds incredibly interesting to me um please chime in and tell me what the hell i'm supposed to remember <laughs> if you can what's up simon Ah, Glenn Fittich. Fire. Hey, John, 68 degrees. Perfect. That is perfect. I don't smoke cigars, but uh, uh, everything else. It's never too late to become who you could have been, though, Steve. Hello, Simon. Hey, Misa Pal. Uh, who else we got here? Oh, Greetings God. from Tucson. Hey, Jethro. 
Dan, oh, yeah, from the hot dog Minnesota. is a sandwich. Is a sandwich. Uh, all right. So the uh, the uh, uh, the Ted Mac thing. For those of you who don't know, that Ted Mac from the Ted Mac original Amateur Hour, which kind of preceded uh, uh, um, Steve Allen, Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan, and uh, there was lots of young kids on there that came on and did played songs and did tricks and stuff like that when they were 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, and all of them became famous. There was, there was, uh, 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 Wayne Newton comes on 10 years old with a little butch haircut, his chubby little baby fat face with whips out a guitar and just tears it up with, Bumblebee, the the flight of the bumblebee. <laughs> he plays it like everybody's amazed that he's Wayne Newton? Wayne Newton. Wayne Donk Newton. Shane. Donk Shane, Wayne Newton. Ten year old Wayne Newton comes on. He's like 10, 12 years old with a guitar. Of the plays bumblebee. Flight of the Bumblebee, just nails it. And then what does he do after he plays it? He plays it again twice as fast. Just yanking the strings off the guitar, and the expression on his so he face. He was ten was, years old, and he was already a dick. The, but the expression on his face wasn't like I'm really trying hard to do this right. The expression on his face was uh, the only reason I dealt. I s s did it double time after doing it the regular speed is because I didn't have time to do it with my teeth. <laughs> That's what well, his you know, expression that's, that's, on his face. His expression was, I, "I can do this. I can do this while juggling plates on my forehead." But, but Ted only gave me thirty-five seconds. You know, so. Well, you know what's kind of weird yeah. about that is, is people who develop that level of skill before puberty. Yeah, and be, before extreme self-awareness, and you know, getting in your own way, and yeah. you know, I'm doing this for my ego. It's kind yeah. of a. a, a uh, thing to behold, right? Yeah. Good God, fifty nine point four ABV on the Octomore. <laughs> That's cask strength, my friends. Um, uh, Brenda Lee, I'm sorry, Brenda Lee. She Brenda was on Lee. there. That oh, was wait. that was. She was a hit. That was a hit. I'm sorry. That was a hit when she was what nineteen or something like that. She was on Ted Ma Mac when she was like thirteen. 12, maybe. Well, when you told me about that, I looked it up. It said Louis Farrakhan was on the, playing <laughs> the violin. Uh, I would have loved to have you make a clip of that so we could watch that nonsense. That would be crazy. <laughs> I was a talented musician on my way to the Philharmonic Orchestra, but then fate intervened. I met Elijah yeah. Muhammad. Oh, now I'm Elijah Muhammad. I met wow. Elijah Muhammad, <laughs> but the re the reason I so that was that whole thing was a curve that I threw at Joe like <laughs> really literally literally fifteen minutes ago, and I so I brought up the uh, the Geritol commercial because like for the last two weeks I've just been feeling like I'm crawling on my hands and knees through monkey vomit just cannot get it together. I have no energy. I'm at my desk. I'm doing this thing. I'm doing that thing. And I'm just, I'm almost on autopilot. I'm just, uh, I got to get this done. Okay. I got to get that done. I have X number of hours in the day and I've got three days worth of work in front of me that has to be done that day. It's not all going to get done, but not only is it not going to get done because it's impossible, but also, I am just feel like maybe I need to start taking vitamins. Maybe I need an iron supplement. Maybe I need something. What is going on? I tried changing my sleep habits, going to bed a little earlier, eating lighter, way back on the booze, all kinds of stuff, and just wasn't making any difference. I just wasn't getting anywhere. Pound of calf's liver? Nah. Nothing was, nothing was working. And then... Um, <clears throat> after last week's show, 
Joe and I start talking about, well, we've got some scheduling conflicts coming up and, and um, the show in two weeks is going to be a little problematic and maybe it better be three. And I was thinking, I don't really want to wait three, but I shouldn't be the one advocating for doing it sooner because I don't have the power to do it as it is, let alone get out of bed. But when we started talking about it, how we were going to, that we really didn't dig as deep in the unintended consequences concept as we had planned to and still went longer than we wanted to go. We started talking about, you know, this, um, the the origins of the pit bull, and the pro and I told Joe that I had the original prototype, and I told him about the, the, uh, uh, you know, the Nelson pit bull, and we were just talking about, um, well, let's check them out, you know, and I said, you know, you really need to come over to the shop and play through it, and because I could be completely out of my mind, and the state of mind I'm in right now. I don't trust anything that comes out of my head or out of my mouth. So just come on over and play and listen. And so just for the hell of it, I plugged into the Nelson Pitbull. And by the, what I mean by that is this is the, well, we'll get into the story, but I, I start plugging into it and it just lit me up. It was just like, holy crap. And so I sent a little, quickie video over to, to Joe to listen to of me just shredding on this thing with that white Mexican Strat, which is a pretty bright guitar. Yeah. And, and uh, he was just like, holy shit, what's that? And we started talking about it. And I just started getting excited. I started getting power back. I started getting all wound up and I'm like doing this. <laughs> and my energy level just shot up. And so then we went over to the storage unit and I said, you know, we have the original Pitbull prototype, not just like a prototype, but the test bed that is, it looks beautiful on the outside and it's a huge rat's nest inside. <laughs> and so we're we're playing it together and while i'm screwing around with it we're just like i'm rediscovering things about it one of the things i discovered about it was it has all these pull pots on it bright deep shift this that edge bleh, ah. and for each one for each one of those pull pots that has a label on it it has sort of a redundant label of one of the other pots that they both seem like when you pull them, it's going to get brighter, but they each do an entirely different thing, even though it's in the upper register. And, and I said, you know, that's actually what I was talking about in the last show when I said, you know, I was in my own, locked in my own little environment and going, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Well, what I realized that I remember that I was actually doing was, putting all these variables on switches so that I could AB and decide, did I like it this way or that way? And, uh, and that didn't really help. It just got me farther down the rabbit hole. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, uh, thanks camera. <sighs> oh, Jesus. My buddy. Yeah, the imaging edge webcam, but we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, uh, it'll come back. I'll turn it on yeah. and turn it off again to see how it goes. Um, so, Joe comes over and and he plays through the the Nelson Pitbull, and I said, you know, it might you might not like it. It might be a little sort of ratty and. Uh, and she starts playing through it, and I'm going, what the hell was I thinking? This thing sounds fantastic. And I just sort of realized that I had it all in my head, that this was this nutty thing. You know, I'm going to do, usually when this thing won't behave, I usually just duck out of the stream for a sec and then come back in. So that's what I'm going to do, and I'll be back in that's just fine. a sec. That's fine. Yeah, so uh, where a, a lot of that came from 
actually was, uh, you know, during the last episode, looking at the, uh, the deliverance um, DNA and then having that discussion about how sort of uh, the sidetrack through designing the Sound City um, influenced the Deliverance Series 2, um, we kind of picked up that conversation. Hey, there he is. And um, it was like, okay, well, one of the things that Steve had talked about, I think, in the last episode was how, um, oddly enough, when the Deliverance came out and it was viewed as like, oh, Fryat's finally stripping things back, you know, from being this company that doesn't amp like the Ultra Lead, Steve's take was kind of like, well, actually, the Deliverance is a little bit kind of a return to what we've always sort of been about. That's where the discussion kind of went, well, maybe we should get into, you know, where that all began. And I had seen the Nelson Pitbull at Steve's house and we'd had the discussion, but um, we didn't plug it in. And and one of my favorite things this week, Steve, was when I asked you, like, well, when was the last time you, you played through this thing? Like a, a year ago, two years ago? <laughs> and your answer was? 20. <laughs> That's nuts. Yeah, I um, I got it. Uh, Gunner Nelson, you, you know the, the the Nelson brothers. They are two just genuinely genuine human beings. You know, there's nothing phony about those guys. Whatever you thought about their band and their poppy image, and they and they were like when they did interviews. You know, they were just the nice, good-looking kids next door. You just wanted to take them and drag them down the alley and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> just on general principles, because then nobody could be that nice and good looking and talented and blah, blah, blah. You just want to, blah. <laughs> but they are talented and they are really nice and they are down, very down home, welcoming pe people and genuinely like we would get together and talk about what they want for their sound and stuff like that. And we would hang out and they were just like genuinely, genuinely friendly engaging guys non-rock star rock just, stars they just made you want to do things for them right just wanted to do whatever you could to be part of it and help out and um uh so they had started doing this thing later on where they're 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 sort of um they're doing an homage to their father ricky nelson they're doing all his songs. They're going out touring, playing all of their father's songs, reimagining them, rearranging them, doing a great job of it. And, and, and Gunner called me up and he goes, hey, man, how you guys doing? And I'm like, we're doing great. And he says, you know, I'm not using my rack anymore. And I'm, I've kind of unloaded most of the stuff out of it. But I wanted to call you first because I've got that, um, that pit bull that you made for me, you know, and... Um, I was thinking that it should be in the in the Fryat Museum, and I'm like, well, oh, I don't really have a museum yet, but, um, you know, uh, is there something you need? And he goes, no, 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 I'm just like, it's just sitting here, and we parted out all the racks and stuff, but... I just didn't feel good selling off this thing. It's just it was so special, and you really put your heart and soul into it for us. And I just thought you should have it back. And I went, oh, it's, you know, I really appreciate that. That's really nice, you guys. Uh, yeah, sure, how much you want for it? And he goes, No, 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 no. You should have it back. You busted your ass to get this for me, and and uh, I think it's I think it's a, a an important part of you know, your company's history and it should be in your museum. I'll, I'm just going to send it to you. I just needed to get your address. And I'm, that is so cool. Isn't that unbelievable. Yeah. So man, I said, tell me about what you're doing. He says, as a matter of fact, we're going to be in, we're going to be in the LA area uh, pretty soon. We're going to be playing at the Canyon club. And I went, Oh, cause I'd really love to see what you're doing with me. I said, you know, when I was a little kid, we all sat around the TV and watched um, Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. The whole family every week sat in front of the TV and watched Ozzy and Harriet and watched Ricky grow into a rock star from 
a kid. And I said, and that's a big part of my memory. I would just love to come and see you guys do that. And so I went down and I watched him and I took a, 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 a pit bull, a, a wide body 45, 112 combo, or maybe it was a 5012, the EL34 5012, might've been that, I forget which one. I took it down there with me. And we went down early enough to catch him at sound check. And so we talked a while and I said, I said, you know, um, I brought a little amp with me that, that might work for you guys. And he's like, really? So I brought it out and they played through it. And I go, oh, this is perfect. It's perfect. We've been using, you know, we've been using a deluxe and this and that, but there's just some parts of the set that aren't really working. And this nails it. So, uh, so, so when can I get one? And I said, ow, here. And he's like, okay, well, you know, just send the invoice to me. I said, no, 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 no. You're sending the pit bull back. This is my gift to you on your new project. And they, you know, thanks, hugs, drinks, watch the set, go home, you know, and uh, the relationship goes on and, and uh, it was really wonderful. So this thing, I just brought it back, put it up on a shelf in the man cave and there it sat since 2000 probably 1999 i want to say and but you built it in 92 92 90 late 91 somewhere between 91 and 92 apparently i built it in the end of 91 and then um i got it back and did a couple of tweaks on it just before they actually rolled out for the tour um so i was gonna say Brad you have some stuff uh labeled in there, 92. Yeah. Well, so they got a, they had a hit song. They had a, they got a record deal. They had a big hit song. They got a giant budget. It was like no holes barred. They wanted the best gear that they could get to tour with. They called up Bradshaw because Bradshaw was doing all the racks. They contacted us because we had the power amps and they were asking Bradshaw what to do about preamps. And he was suggesting preamps. And then he called me and said, is your preamp ready? And I said, no, it's not. And they contacted uh, Making Music at the time, who was our dealer, and that they were selling, you know, us and Soldano and some other stuff. And and we had pitched that we were going to make a rack mat head in addition to a traditional head of the Pitbull. But we hadn't actually built any yet. But Gunner was like, that's perfect. That'll be perfect. So... I'll take one of those. So he placed the first order, which turned out to be the first and only order of the Pitbull rack mount head. <laughs> and, you know, they gave me a deadline, six months. And I said, yeah, I can meet that. And uh, they probably, I think they paid half of it in advance or something, you know. So I was really on the hook. <laughs> yeah. And I told them I could deliver. So uh, that was all there was to it, you know. And then after a, a all this time, you know, after that, power amps sales are like going like this, and the pitbull heads just coming out and back ordered like crazy. And uh, we're like struggling just to try to get everything built. And um, every once in a while, Bradshaw would, would call me and how's it going with that preamp, that rack mount head? And I said, Yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And I hadn't done anything i just told him it's coming i had done nothing about it <laughs> i just figured when when the pressure gets high enough i'll be forced to act and that i mean it's kind of part of my mo i have to certain things that really require a leap they they have their time but you were just learning how to operate or how to run your company from oh, scratch God. that's yeah. a lot yeah, there I was mean, a lot going on. And I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking, oh, you know, you just buy some parts and you build some stuff and woo. And wasn't your it, shop in your apartment at that point? Uh, they when they ordered that, it was in my apartment. Um, <laughs> and we had it when it was completed. We had just moved into our first shop, which was right next door to Bradshaw. Mm. So, <clears throat> yeah. The, the the thing of, oh, yeah, you just start a company and you start building stuff. That was pretty much like, no, no, it's not really the way it works. You, 
<laughs> you have a background and you have a business, some business background or somebody in your company that does and you organize your company and you do blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, you just buy some parts and drill some holes and solder some shit. <laughs> and uh, um, so we were just like, we were learning on the fly while being chased down by everybody that was really legitimately in the music business going, what are you guys doing over there? And we're just like, we're just filling orders. Soldering some shit. We're soldering shit. So this went on and on and on and on. And, uh, and then Bradshaw says, okay, I'm finishing this rack on X date. And that had, had better be here by that date. I went, okay, that's what I needed to hear. And that date was like, um, six weeks or less than ground zero. Right. And you had nothing. I had nothing. Um, but I also knew that they didn't need everything that I was working on in the head. They just needed the essence of it. They needed the clean sound. They needed the rhythm sound. They needed the lead sound. And that was everything that they had heard in the prototype that they were interested in. And they hadn't heard all of the machinations that we were going through trying to decide which version of it was going to exist. And that was kind of still being hammered out. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that all got hammered out, then it would be time to go start formulating a head, a rack mount version of it. And, you know, by that time, the rack mount head thing was starting to be like, you know what, with all the preamps that are available and all the switching stuff that's out there right now, that maybe that's just not going to be something to, that we should really focus our time in. But we're already committed to Nelson, right? So we have to do it. Right. You have the one off you need to do. Yeah. And uh, at that time, you know, there was no internet, but we had the recycler, which is the paper, the buy and sell, the local buy and sell paper where you bought and sold musical gear through there. Uh, you bought and sold every kind of musical gear through there and dealers advertised there and, and all of that. And before I officially started the company, that's what I was doing. I was buying in between having left Valley Arts and then went to Music Tech and then having left music tech i was buying and selling uh modified or broken marshalls and mesas you were flipping wood. stuff you were flipping it. I, yeah i was flipping Basically. stuff you buy flipping. broken stuff fix it up and then yeah let it I was loose again yeah i was buying heads and cabinets and preamps and odds and ends and and um the stuff that was just new enough on the market that the average tech guy in LA that basically knew how to fix a twin, it was over his head. Um, but not so progressive that it was junk sounding stuff. It was like, you know, um, late seventies marshals and, and vintage marshals and high Watts, and just all kinds of things, Vox. So whenever I could get my hands on something, I would grab it for pennies on the dollar, rebuild it. It turned out to be really easy, and uh, and it was easy. It was it was easy for me to make money doing that and not having a day job. And I started having wads of cash stacking up in my sock drawer. I mean, I'd open my sock drawer and there'd be like thirteen thousand dollars in cash sitting in there for after a while. <laughs> From this and racket I'd, like, that you. Yeah, and I just like, like I need to go go to the grocery store. Open my open my sock drawer and grab a handful of cash and go to the grocery store and like stock up for a month and go back into my home. Mm. And um, so, having had done a lot of repair work for the local repair shops, there at the local dealers, the retail outlets, and used gear outlets, I knew. Were, where the stuff was and and how much to pay for it and all that and i found a 1976 late 76 um 2204 i guess it is the, the 50, 50 watt, watt the 50 watt master volume marshall 
two input jacks, and the square rocker switches, not the toggles. The early 76 had toggle switches on it. The late 76, mm -hmm. they switched over to the rocker switches. So it already had those rectangular switch holes in it like we were already using. Yeah. So, and it needed to be rack mountable. And I checked it out and that chassis was 17 inches wide, just under, just about 17 inches wide. Had these little mounting flanges on that made it wider, but I, I figured, well, I can just cut those off. So I went to Lancaster, bought that amp for 200 bucks and brought it back and just stripped it down to the chassis. And, uh, uh, and then I used our power transformer, 100 watt power transformer, 100 watt output transformer, built that in there and uh, um, reconfigured different parts of the chassis so that I could get four tubes in it, four power tubes and six preamp tubes and an effects loop and multiple channels and remote foot switching stuff and all this stuff, variable line out. And I just jam packed it all in there. And in about two, three weeks, I had it up and running. And then I had this local guy that just, um, this local Japanese guy that had this engraving business. He made, uh, he made control panels for industrial electronics companies that made one off testing equipment, you know, like for, for, um, for JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories and different, you know, air, um, Air Force contractors and all this stuff like that, and he just he just had a re he made these really nice precision laminated f uh, formica panels that you engrave the black off and it leaves the white text. And he was really good at it. He was turned on to me by a guy that used to work at Valley Arts that it, that did some special projects for himself and for his friends. So I had already been using him for some other things that I was working on. I'd built this little switching system for a rack uh, in probably 86, 85, 86. I was building a little memory switcher thing to build a rack system for myself. And uh, so I had him make the front panel. I put a big aluminum front panel on the front of this chassis and the little flaps on the side of the chassis that held it into the cabinet, the Marshall cabinet. I sliced those off, not only to make the chassis narrow enough to fit in a rack configuration, but I also used them as braces to, to brace the front panel, which was quite tall over the chassis. So those formed um, the chassis braces. Those are the mounting flanges that go along yeah. the bottom of the side of that chassis converted. You can see the rectangular holes where the snap-in bolts fit in there. Um, that Those got turned into rack bra the, the, the front panel support brackets. And then that little band, metal band across there with all the pots on it. That was the clean channel. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I put it up there because there wasn't room to put it down in the main chassis because the whole front panel was already just full of knobs. So I put the clean channel up there. It could be up there because it, first of all, it was in, in the rack system and it's low, a low gain enough channel that it could afford to be, you know, outside of the chassis and not pick up any hum. So, uh, um, uh, that's what I did. I just shoehorned that thing together in like lightning speed. I used some of the original Marshall bits and pieces that were appropriate, you know, the fuse holders, the jet input and output jacks, and uh, the, uh, you know, some of the mains wiring, some of the capacitors, part of the circuit board, and the rest of it, and just shoehorned it all together. Uh, that's, um, since I took the power supply capacitors off the top of the chassis to make room for the extra two power tubes, I put the filter capacitors on a separate board inside. And then to the right of that is the channel switching matrix so that I could switch to three different channels. And that's attached to what's left of the original um, Marshall circuit board, which is yeah, heavily, look at that. heavily modified. And then uh, as we go to the, as we move to the right, you see more and more 
just bad craziness taking place and um <laughs> bad craziness but i had to i had to get it done i had to make keep it to the essential functional things that it was being purchased for and i had to include the features that i knew that they needed that, and the things that bradshaw wanted included in there so that it would work according to the specifications that he'd laid out for the entire system and then a couple of few extra ideas of, that that i had thought of after the fact and so that's it it um if looking at the top of the chassis is pretty hilarious too because you see all the the, the stuff just jammed on there but uh i got it done i tested it i took it over to bradshaw and he went awesome not awesome because he heard it and it sounded great awesome because i delivered the goods and he could finish the rack for them i contacted him last week and said hey bob you know what would be really be great is if you wanted to jump in on the show and like talk about if there's any funny crazy shit that you remember about that project i said because it was pretty intense and he goes nah you know i mean i appreciate thanks for thanks for the uh, invitation i'd love to i'd love to participate but really i mean we were all working so we were all doing so much stuff so fast for so many people it was all just a blur and he says stupidly i didn't take pictures of my work and i didn't keep notes and i really don't remember anything about it other than it had white cabs and uh he said my assistant guy did most of the work and uh, uh i just basically set out the specs and away we went so they took it out he he got it all in, got it up and running. He called me up. He says, there's a couple little things that probably could be improved upon, a little of this, a little of this, making a little funny noise, and the switching, blah, 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 try this. And I took it back, and I did a couple of tweaks on it. And um, uh, and then I gave it back to him, and he went, great. It's all done. Delivered it to them. They went and toured for two straight years with that thing. And you saw in that previous picture that there was one – groove tube and there was there's three other el34s that have the vht logo on them and uh what had happened was one power tube in the two years that they had a thing one power tube went bad and they replaced that power tube and that's the power tube that they replaced so this has got all the original tubes in it that were in it when it shipped and they're still in it and they're all the same power tube actually even though it's got the gt logo they're still all rft el 34s uh they were originally siemens branded uh, but they're actually made by the that rft the east german uh tube manufacturing company uh and what's really interesting about those is um uh uh electro harmonics bought the tooling once they closed down that rft factory uh and they use that tooling to make the current mullard reissue tubes so the current really mullard reissues are very much like those tubes they look like them inside all the components are shaped the same of course they are because they're made on the same tooling and uh so uh it, it's really interesting that, that it has those tubes in it and that they're still working so well uh and um those are the same tubes that we used in the classic power amps when we were making those and they're still those things lasted forever also so that going through that whole process pulling that thing out cleaning it up the pots it, it didn't really work right at first because the pots were dirty that was the only thing that was wrong with it when you turn the <laughs> pot they were so covered with dust from just sitting on the shelf for 20 years and not playing through it that that they would just the, the circuit it would just open the circuit by turning the pot and you know the signal would stop going through it so all i had to do was clean the pots dust it off fire it up check the bias had joe come over am i kidding myself or is this this thing um not pleasant to listen to or am i'm not just dialing it right or because i'm again i'm still kind of in this i'm i'm slogging i'm slogging through through molasses and i don't really have a sense of my feet being on the ground right at the moment uh, so he came over and played through it, and he just started blasting stuff out of it and going, this is this is amazing. And then we had, uh, uh, and then Dean from STP uh, sent his guys over to get one of his, uh, one of his classic power amps uh, retubed because they're getting ready to go out 
and play a super spreader event in in <laughs> Sturgis in, in Sturgis and like I'm like going guys take care I know you're smart and you're not going to do anything stupid but just be careful and and uh, so they came in uh, uh Bruce of N Bruce Nelson guitars uh who's their who's Dean's main tech and and Richie Mazetta uh who is also uh was doing tech work for Dean and also is the guitar tech for Sting. So they both came over and they're both good guitar players and 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 uh and Richie st starts playing this guitar of Bruce's. So this is Richie playing a Nelson guitar through the Nelson pit bull and he's just slaying it and I think that I'm making a video of him and turns out I only got a picture. He's killing it and this guitar is amazing it's a junior because <laughs> i walked in at the tail end of that yeah and it's yeah. this junior joe picks up the junior and he goes "Fuck! everything is perfect about this car the weight the sound the shape of the neck the frets the the string you know he's just like going there isn't and 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 bruce is going what do you think and bruce and and joe is like i think that there isn't a single thing wrong with this guitar everything is just perfect and so it was fun. We had a little fun with that. And and Richie, who's got this really interesting style of playing chords that sound really thick and juicy. And he was playing that through that. And he was just blown away at the sounds coming out of it. And we're like talking about this going, you know, it, the, the Nelson guys, you know, they had pro touring guys backing them up live, right? You know, they didn't Brett really. Garson was in that band. Yeah. So they didn't really have to play the stuff, you know. So to this day, he probably didn't even really know what that amp was capable of. And I didn't honestly remember because I'm just trying to get it done. I'm not trying to overthink it. And so at the just shortly a year after I've built this, this test platform where it's just an, a work in progress and a massive multiple different experiments all going on simultaneously to you don't have time to overthink this. You need to get this done for these guys and get them on the road and on their way. And you got it. And and it's got to work and it's got to stay working. So those are two completely different aspects of the beginning of the Pitbull thing that are just really hilarious. And the more I started thinking about it and the more Joe and I played through these things and talked about it more, God, all my power and energy is coming back to the point where I'm just bouncing off the walls. And I'm going, that's all I needed. I just needed like, I just needed like a kick in the butt and some inspiration and to have some fun. And like all that lethargy just dropped away. And then during that time, same period of time, I had gone to the Greek and seen Joe Bonamassa play live. And it was the first time I'd ever seen him play live. And it was the first show of the Greek since they opened it. So, um, uh, so a buddy called me up and said, Hey, I got tickets. You want to go? Yeah. So we went. And uh, I'm listening, and this is before I'd really gotten my energy back. I'm just starting to like, okay, I don't want to be dismissive. I don't want to like look my note, look down my nose at anybody or anything like that. But I'm really not sure what I'm hearing here. Uh, the, the at the beginning of the set, the guitar sound is nice and bold, you know, and up front, and it's like a real guitar through real amps and great. But I kept going like this, you know, there's something really missing, but I'm with a buddy, you know, I don't want to rain on his parade, you know, so I'm just keeping my mouth shut. But every once in a while I turn around, I go, you know, Mark, is it, is it me? Or, and he goes, no, it's not you. I didn't finish the sentence. He just looks at me and goes, no, it's not you. I just felt like that there was something really missing. And as he's going along, it's getting more repetitive and more like uninspiring. And I'm going, you know, Hey dude, I, I don't want to rain in your parade, but is it me? He's no, it's not you. And uh, that was the first time he'd seen him live too. He's just a guitar. He's uh, he's my trademark attorney actually, but he's a gear geek and he's a, he's a guitar enthusiast, you know, and he enjoys rock and roll music, guitar music. He enjoys jazz and high levels of playing ability. And he's just like really into it. You know, it's just one of those guys. And he's just like, when I'd look up at him, he I'd be, I'd look at him, he'd be doing this. 
Okay, but wait a minute. Hold that. Hold that. And that's what I've been doing. Right? That's a guitar show right there. You were just doing it. Folded yeah. arms. Yeah. <laughs> Sausage fest. And uh, the I was life just... of a guitar hero. That's and it, and and not only that, but the the sound started getting progressively weaker and weaker and weaker as the set progressed. Now there was no opening act, and it was like two hours set. Oh damn! So by the end of it, I was already one hour past. I wish it had been over because it just was like. This is Bonamassa playing his signature licks into with an SG. This is Bonamassa playing his signature licks into a uh, with a Strat. This is Bonamassa playing his signature licks on a hey Les man, Paul. If you want that, if you want that, you're in you're in business, right? Because he's serving it up. He's Long serving show. it up. But it wasn't like it wasn't like this hair standing up on your arms kind of. It was just. When you go to a bar and yeah, give me a double margarita. <laughs> that was that was great. Give me another do double margarita. And you, you just drink double margaritas for two straight hours until they haul you home. You know, it wasn't like this is the best margarita ever. It's just like <laughs> next, you know. Um, I was a little bit put off by the Silver Jubilees. You know, one of the <laughs> in, in in my humble opinion. Probably I was surprised the, when you told me he was using them again. I thought he retired one, those things. One of the least exciting marshals ever created. And that was their what their their twentieth, twenty fifth anniversary, twenty fifth anniversary, when that came out. And on their thirtieth anniversary, they came out with a multi channel amp. They didn't like go back to their roots. They so oh, we're gonna show all those boutique amp fire companies in L.A. how a multi channel amp is really done, and they didn't. And uh, <laughs> bear, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat it out loud. It's just good enough the way it is. <laughs> did did, did um, he play? Did he play through the old uh, the the tweed he, stuff? He had two, he had the two tweeds. He had the two jubilees, and a couple of other things in a dumble. It was like the a obligatory, dumble. like the obligatory dumble. Like if you didn't bring it, the Dumble guys would be. Oh, how come you didn't bring the Dumble? Did, did he did he play politician on the Dumble? No. Sorry, no. Uh, I didn't recognize. You have I to didn't play politician recognize, on the Dumble. Or what are you doing? I didn't, I didn't recognize almost any of the songs in the entire set until the very end. So he goes off. At the end of the set, he goes off. No ovation. Just people go. It's like thanks, and they all like get up and start walking out. Mm -hmm. Like some of the audience is really enthusiastic, and a lot of them were just like, "Okay, I've had enough." And they just, as soon as he stopped and the band walks off the stage, people start heading for the exits. No ovation, no like big. It was a long like, show, right? Yeah, it was a long two hours. So then Joe comes back out with an acoustic guitar. And starts reefing away on an acoustic. And like, okay. First of all, he didn't get an over <laughs> Ingve of the blues. Yeah, he's kind of the Ingve of the blues. Yeah. And, was, uh oh, here we and go. And like, okay, let's okay, he wants to play an acoustic song by himself, a solo acoustic performance. And so he starts playing all this riffage on an acoustic, which okay, fine, but it's an acoustic that's got the piezo pickups in it, right? And it's going direct into, the, it's going direct to front of house, so you don't hear the string and the resonance of the body and an acoustic guitar being flayed on. What you hear are um, motion sensitive pickups under the top of the Bruce top of the guitar, reacting to pick attack. Yeah. So these little notes on top of boom, 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 and again, so I turn around to Mark, I go, is it just, and he looks at me, he goes, that has got to stop. I didn't even finish, is it, is it, no, that's got to stop. And um, uh, and then he leaves, comes back, they do Crossroads. I know Crossroads inside and out, every which way. 
And it's like, okay, at least you ended up with something that I could sort of relate to. And then we left. And that was my first live performance experience in a long time. And when I left there, I still was feeling like, <sighs> and then, you know, this the, this conversation starts up and we start getting this and I build, I'm building up my energy and I'm feeling alive again and blah, 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 and all this is going on. And then I noticed that King Crimson is playing locally, playing at the Greek. So who's uh, in King Crimson these days? Um, well, I don't remember every single person's name, but, um, that's but actually Mas Mas and two other guys are playing drums. They had three drummers and it was fantastic. It was a fantastic, three now. fantastic show. And, uh, my wife and I went to watch it and she was really into it. You know, she, I said, you want to go see Crimson? I said, are you kidding me? Yeah. So we went and saw Crimson and, uh, the Zappa band opened up. And so Jamie, you know, our buddy Jamie Kime is in that band. And he's just like tearing it up. They were great. And he was great. And that was exciting. And then, and then Crimson comes out and they're just, I, there's three gorgeous high impact drum kits on the front of the stage. And the rest of the guys in the band are on a riser behind the drums. Holy and it's crap, a whole concept. Michael. It's a whole concept. But man, let me tell you, that was just an awesome, awesome concert. And that went, that was a two hour thing too. And it went by like, God, I'd stay for another hour for that. It was so exciting. And they did red and they did uh um 20th century. Jack and they did, is playing in that band. Yeah, yeah. Jack and Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I remember when Jocko and was in uh, level 42. It was to minute. die for. And you know what? The guitar sound wasn't that phenomenal, but it was, but it was um, Fripp doing the best Fripp that you've ever heard Fripp do. And he doesn't need to have this, you know, that that uh you know um well, i mean it's funny like he re repurposed things throughout his entire career yeah um, yeah and he just doesn't he just doesn't need to be he's not the person that you associate with the grail tone of any kind oh no 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 right no. and you don't expect that but it's an what approach he, it's approach and what he does what he does do is he orchestrates this concept and explores layers and dynamics and space and emotions and i never heard red played it with the intensity that it was played even though they're not really playing they're not like really playing hard and intense they're playing very focused and studied but it is intense because what's going on with the drums and the layering and all that so when when he's playing actually his parts they're almost sort of wheely sounding you know but again it doesn't matter because all the depth well and the orchestration of it and the the way it's all presented is just so perfectly flawless and and the way he uses music to express emotions is like it's just too, is bar none nobody can touch that and to watch all that go down was just like yes this is what music and inspiration is really about and so that was last night and so today i'm just like got energy flying out of my brain i just really, it's funny really you know if if, if I think of Fripp, you know, uh, certain things that he plays, like having a big gargantuan tone, like kind of wouldn't work. Yeah. Right. There's just so much delicacy and space in there. You wouldn't need to stomp all over it with, you know, big no, things. No, 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 because a, a lot of those it. things, it's it's almost like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of like the Baloo era where it's like a gamelan thing where, you know, you have your parts and you have your parts and like, everything you know tony levin his parts they they all kind of lock in and you remove one and it's like okay that's an interesting little exercise yeah but you start layering them all together and it's it becomes something entirely different and it's not really designed um you know to work with the the classical you know king kong tone of death yeah i love the blue era too man 
Actually, that the, was really the first era that I got into uh, the band with and then had to work my way backwards. Yeah. Really great. Yeah, that was that was my first that well, no, that wasn't exactly my first introduction to to Crimson, but it was my first introduction to the the evolution of Crimson. And mm. and I and I bought that album and, and like really that got stuff? into it. Man, those those two uh what were they called? The the blue records, I forget. Discipline and anyway, yeah. that stuff still it's, sounds fresh to me. It does. Like, yeah. 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 And and the but the thing about the drums being in front wasn't it was more about to take to uh, refocus your attention on the entirety of the thing, not just like on the singer or on Fripp, you know, and he always is He's way in the back anyway. He doesn't like to focus attention on himself. And this was really an expression of that. And it was really great. It was everything about it was great. But the thing about having the drums, see, I come from drums and my Beat. wife comes yeah. from drums. So we understand drums. And to, to be able to see those right three guys up front, um, um, cooperating in the way that they're, they're sharing the the drum performance. They're um, they're not just being individual virtuosos. They're interacting with each other in such a way that they're spreading the the work and the dynamics and the different sounds of their different unique kits and their styles those things are all interacting with each other so they would play sometimes they would all three take turns playing the same riff but they would have an entirely different impact from each other sure. played them differently their drums sounded different and all yeah. of this it was just just layers and layers of interesting things to wrap your brain around and it was just really just awesome so this has been a real roller coaster of a two-week period for me where i went from I don't even know which way is up to like, I am so energized. And, uh, and then, um, and then, uh, uh, and then the, the, the STP guys bring over the power amp and get them taken care of. We hang out a little bit, have some fun and they take off. And then, uh, and then Dean call, I, I, at the end of the day, I look at my phone and, and Dean had left a voicemail message for me. And, uh, God, I hadn't talked to him for so long. We hardly ever talk. It's usually through his he his guys. He sends his guys to do this and blah, 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 blah. We don't really talk that much because he's like knows what he wants and he doesn't really change his gear that much. He just needs it to work all the time. So there really isn't a whole lot of commiserating going on. It's just occasional, hey, how you doing? And blah, 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 blah. Nice talking to you. See you later. So when I got this this voice fail from him, I just thought, oh, I wonder what this is about. I wonder what he needs. And he, he didn't need anything. He just called to say, the, uh, the stuff it's is pitching. called sounds... Say I Love You. Yeah. And it sounds like this. <laughs> hey, Steve. It's Dean DeLeo. Sorry I missed your call, man. We was, uh, we was uh, playing real loud music yesterday. I, had, I, I, got, I, I got these dang VHT amps, man. They are loud. <laughs> couldn't, hear, couldn't hear much more than guitar. I'm around, man. I just, I just wanted to call and, and just say thank you so much for everything for all these years of uh, taking such great care of us and uh, allowing me to be louder and clearer and sound uh, better than everybody else. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, hit me whenever you have a chance. I'm around most of the day. Bye. <laughs> That's too cool. And I just sit there and stared at my phone for a few minutes and went, oh. It, that just like couldn't have been the better end of a week. So I thought, okay, this is great. We're going to have lots of fun, lots of stuff to share on the show. We're going to go too long. I mean, we're already an hour, over an hour in, and we haven't really done anything except listen No, to I think me. we're doing good. I think we're doing good. We already played. No, wait. You, oh, never mind. We're not doing good. You haven't played. We're in trouble. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> So we were trying to figure out what you know what we're gonna do. We I showed mean, pictures. Were... <laughs> yeah, we showed pictures. Uh, Which, by the I way, uh, yeah. What what about that? Uh, the you had the the layout of the Nelson Pitbull, the schematic. Yeah. Well, I went through. I I went digging through uh, my paperwork. Uh, I was actually looking for something else, and um, 
I think I was, we were talking about, I was going to pull out the, 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 uh, the head prototype, the, 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 um, the working, uh, work in progress prototype. And I was th thought I had a document of that someplace and I stumbled across the Nelson Pitbull. And I thought, I don't even remember documenting that, but it's just a, it's just a, just a, st that's the way I did the schematics and I, it, between 89 and 90, 90, two, three, four, until I started really doing official schematics. And that's the way they look, just like some guy sitting in a bar on a Tuesday night <laughs> with a Manhattan and a pen that barely worked and, and dim lights and just like, I think it's like this. You know? <laughs> uh, trying to document stuff. It was really interesting about the schematic is it's, 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 it's all the essential basic parts of the circuit, but it doesn't show how anything switches or what the things that are switchable, how they're connected to any switches. But it, it's that stuff that's, that's easy to figure out. So this was the mentality. This was the mindset at the time. The essential thing, get the essential thing, get it done, get it out, get on to the next thing. And um, you know, to hear different players come back and to be able to go back and plug into it and play through it and and get refreshed on that. Cause I was starting to think like, what, what, you know, people are talking about the ultra lead and they're talking about, you know, what about, what about the pit bull thing? And, I'm, you know, we've been talking about it around here. What, how are we going to approach that? Um, you know, going forward with the new models and we just discussed the deliverance and, you know, the, how that's a part of the evolution of this whole process. And, and uh, I was just kind of curious how closely everything sort of hewed to that. And I was surprised to see that there was not only this nice uh, connection from stage to stage to stage in the development of the amps, but that there was something essential in the original ones that, that are unique. Um, and in hindsight, with better skill and better uh, a better sort of overview of everything, there's stuff in there that I go, you know, there's actually some really interesting bits and pieces going on in there that, um, uh, that, uh, are, that warrant revisiting. So that, that's pretty cool. So this, this just the last couple of weeks. Oh, and then, and then we got the, um, we got the first, um, beta, and this is just for you guys. I'm not talking about it to anybody else, and I don't want don't go don't go bust on your dealers and start telling them that uh, you know you saw it and you want to order it. But here's this is the uh, this is the initial production uh, release of the Powerload PLIR. Um, we're doing um, we're 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 testing and evaluating the the first production units before we actually release the whole production. And so they're here. Yes. So that's amazing. And uh, God, there's just so many things going on. There's just so many cool things going on. I don't even know okay, but, but, what to say about it. Do anything. you see this? Do you see this question up here from loud guitar? Uh, no, I was just mm -hmm. thinking of all the stuff mm -hmm. that's going on. That's been going on this week. I mean, I watched the, mm -hmm. I watched Tone Talk this morning for a little while, and people are like asking about, you know, what about the power station? What about the power station? And and uh, is it really the best thing out there? And he's going, yeah, actually, it really is, you know. And while he's saying that, uh, you know, our iPhones are connected to our web store, right? You know, so we get pinged when people start hitting our web store. So. As that show is going on, they're talking about the PS100. It, it's like people are like hitting our web store, trying to order a PS100. <laughs> and just like, oh, shout out to like, Talk. Thanks, Dave. Shut up. We're already so backward. But you know, no, I mean, but that's awesome. So what? Is, what is Big the question shout out that to you're referring to? Those guys rule. Loud guitar. Oh yeah, uh, the tone shot. The, the 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 tone talk guys had just been really. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, I can't take it anymore. Are you going to reissue the pit bull? Uh, well, no, we're not. Uh, because the, uh, uh. no, because we we never made a pit bull with one T. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a high level dodge, <laughs> Fred. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry, I'm just fucking with you. So, Loud Guitar, yeah. feel free to rephrase that question. Yeah. <laughs> put him on the spot again. <laughs> because I happen to think that Nelson Pitbull behind you has the magic sauce. There is I something think people very... would like to have their hands on that. I know I do. Um, I want to twist your arm. See, well, not really, because then it, you can't build amps. It's 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 like this is what we were talking about before, and this is the thing that's getting me re-energized. Is that yeah, we're overloaded, uh, loud. I lived in Canada for a year. I lived in Vancouver and played around Western Canada for a year. And uh, I have relatives there. I love Canada. Uh, and uh, and and uh, don't feel bad, eh? And uh, I love Canada uh, too. It's just Some just this whole from Canada. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful country. Um, it's just with all the stuff that's going on. It's just, it's just so amazing. And there's so many projects that are in the works and um, uh, things that we haven't talked about yet and all the things that people are already waiting for and we're trying to like figure out where everything is going to land. You know, the new Ultra League, we've been talking about the, the configuration of that and how it's going to end up. But, but this is, it's good to be able to go back and revisit the roots of that so that we can look at it and go, where does it really need to land? And what what can we take from going back to the beginning of the whole uh, the whole story of the development of what ended up being the ultra lead? And and I just realized that you know what, this is going to be a perfect opportunity to go look at the essential part of the sauce that really makes it what it is, and maybe dispense with some of the stuff that that nobody actually used understood or really cared about what they really cared about was the essence of it and so maybe that's going to inform us about the final form of the new ultra league going forward i've been i've been talking to Paige hamilton i've been talking to rob caggiano i've been talking to like a bunch of different people that um are ultra lead uh aficionados and and users and and all of that and um i'm getting some great feedback and what i'm what i'm finding is is that they're really you know as players they're really focused on the essential part of it that is most associated with their style right so that's where we really need to focus our effort not on bells and whistles because we were never about bells and whistles when we would produce something and then somebody would say it'd be great if you just had this or just added that well part of the reason that we did that and could do that is because that was the whole process of developing it in the first place what about do having it do this way? what about making it that way what about okay let's just make a switch and make it so that you can do both but at the end of the day what that also does and what i learned from you know rivera's efforts in that regard which is that you can overdo that you can give people enough tools to smash themselves in the forehead and pound their toes and mm -hmm. and, and just ruin the whole experience and uh, so there's something to be said for going back and like you said extracting what is the essential sauce of um of the design and the sound forget about the design only think about the the end result the sound the playing experience uh and right what it brings, right and and you're going to you know with with the the reissues of these amplifiers you're going to bring the steve Fryette of 2021 2022 all of that finesse and skill and bring those series to uh make those little refinements and tweaks that amp behind you Here's the thing. If we call it being built in 1992 and you build, I don't know, pick your number of them in 2022, you only get a 30th anniversary every 30 years. And you wouldn't even have to refine the damn thing. You could just build them up just like that. 
because it's magical just like that. Well, yeah. I and we put the clean channel on the outside of the chassis. <laughs> That's too cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, but we would also want it to be, you know, uh, well, see, my response to that, but well, we want it to be reliable and quiet and all that. And, and, uh, and what are we talking about? An amp behind me that's 30 years old that, that went on the road for uh, 100 and, 110 weeks and uh, and blew one power tube in the whole time. And um, yeah. the only thing the only thing it ever needed after after 29 years was the pot sprayed. And um, you know, yeah, there's that. But we've also, like we talked last time, there's also a process of where you've where we've learned something we've developed we've we've developed formulas we've developed a, a sense of the how the clean sound is best expressed how the you know the the mid gain the the edge of breakup and the mid gain kind of things um are most useful to the, a wider variety of people. And that doesn't mean making a bunch of switches so a bunch of people that can switch it the way they like it. It just means yeah. putting it in a range that is more easily accessible to a wider a, a array of players. And uh, um, and there's there, while there are some things that are pleasing about it, it does have to be put to an attenuator because it's just way too fucking loud the way it is. And um, that's because... At the time, but that's fine. We were still we using have those now. Well, Fry yeah, makes but, those, but still, we're using lower plate voltages than we used to because you know we want the tubes to last longer and we want them to be more reliable. And having that much plate voltage isn't necessarily yeah. Even though you have those, it'd be nice that you get a good sound of it without having to having to use that. So there is there is but a bit you're of that. not. You're not going to do that amplifier as like the full blown Pitbull reboot. It no. would be the, the Nelson Pitbull limited run, just like that, raw as hell. It, no refinements, because that's that's the beauty and the magic of that particular amplifier sitting behind you. If if you wanted to reboot the Pitbull proper later on and have it be more of a production amplifier, that's another. Uh, question to answer entirely i think very well could be but on the other I'm hand gonna, i'm gonna bug you well on the other hand I, I i showed you a perfect example of a just like the same but slightly refined expression of the clean thing and you just went that's totally it right yes, so you did. there's something to be said okay. for that but that was one aspect of of the mm -hmm. nelson pitbull I'm gonna argue. You argue all you want. Argue away. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Um, because I love that amplifier. It does something special. A stripped back deliverance type of version would be great. How much more fucking stripped back can it be than the deliverance? Just have a knob. I think. I think sometimes. I or think maybe like. There's so much chatter on the difference between people and models. It seems to give people anxiety about the right one. Are they really that different? What's the diff? Uh, no, they're not. They're not remarkably different. They're different in subtle ways because they have undergone subtle um, evolution over time. So uh, maybe there was just some slight raggediness of a character in a particular channel or something like that that now has the sparkle and the punch and all the stuff that you want, but without the raggedy part. And um, I mean, let's face it, there's all kinds of different guitars that you can use it with and you can get all kinds of different outcomes and you have to be a pretty skilled player. That was the thing. You have to be a pretty skilled player to, uh, to be able to navigate all that in an amp that's that raw, right? And frankly, that does, that turns people off when, they can't manage that, and there's a lot of people that can't. And those are the people that call it the, the unforgiving, tight, stiff, blah 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 blah. Um, you know, I mean, people don't like to have their 
I kind of brag. I, I I'm I I kind of brag about how sloppy and un, undisciplined of a player I am. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but a lot of people are are embarrassed by that. They don't like having their flaws, uh, you know, made apparent to everybody in the room. Um, I can't help mine, but I, I like to have um, you know tools that kind of at least suggest that I should up my damn game. <laughs> yeah, you know? and we hewed we pretty closely to that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you'd, you'd find it. You'd find it um, mm -hmm. to be, if we can just move it, move it forward, knowing what we know that works a little better now, it doesn't really change the essential formula. It just makes it a little bit more musical, just slightly more musical um and um more malleable with different guitars that's really all it is um if we were going to do something like that i would well it would have to be made producible you know i wouldn't want to make it like exactly like that that would be a mess sure 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 but it would be uh, undoable I, it has to be something that is is producible and um you know uh w well engineered and um yeah, I understand why. The, the fact that the, the fact that this thing is has lasted as long as it had has is it's always been in a rat case or it's been in storage for thirty years, you know. So it hasn't really gone through all the rigors that gear that people use for years and years and years, like Dean, for example. You know, he's but been pounding on those. He's been pounding on those classic power amps since nineteen ninety two. Year but after I, year, I, decade after decade, I, he's been beating the, him and Mick Mars have been beating the snot out of those amps. If those guys were playing that, you know, who knows? It probably would have been falling apart a couple of times. But. Now, look, I, I haven't played it, but you know, I, I look at it like, um, you know, the 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 Fender Custom Shop. You know, when they did like Ingve's Duck Strat or something, like mm. it's it's built for kind of weird people who aren't you know you're not going to see people taking that on the road or whatever people just want this exact reproduction of this particular thing um you know again a, a limited run of the nelson pitbull is not really related to a full reboot of the pitbull proper in my mind yeah i mean well when you, you know well let's let's look at this for just a second Let's yeah. Just, let's just say we're looking at this for a second. Um, and let's talk about the clean channel. The clean okay. channel, I have the base at 11 o'clock, the middle at 10 o'clock, the treble at 9 o'clock, and the volume at one o'clock and there's no master volume for that clean channel now um what a lot of people do what a lot of people do is they set amps the way they're used to setting them sure that's something that i've learned a long time ago that regardless of where you tell people that the amp will sound the way they want it to sound set a certain way they're not going to set it that way. They're going to set it the way they're used to setting the knobs. It's just a yeah. They're not using their ears. It's a sense memory. It's a muscle memory. You just put. I always put the middle at ten o'clock and the treble at, at at two. You do that on this, and it's going to be unbearably bright and unplayable. You know, but somebody's going to set it that way, and they're going to say, oh, "How come the clean channel is so brittle?" Uh, turn the treble down. Yeah, but I'm not used to turning the treble down that that low. But you're going to have to. Um, so what I'm talking about, evolving the design to work out those little sort of, you know, conversations that we have, I'm talking about the things that make it so that people can, so that it's more malleable to individual players where they can set it, where they're comfortable with it, and where it will sound good at any of those settings, not these sort of specific prescriptions that you better follow or you're screwed. You know, that's what I'm talking about. And, um, or, or, or because it would be such a limited run amplifier, I mean, you know, the people who buy it should know what the hell it is that they're buying. Well, here's the other you thing know, is, is this was made in such, 
this was made under such intense effort to get it together on a timeline the scrutiny to refine it to the point where it would be more malleable it didn't come into play because that wasn't that wasn't the primary thing and the and the way it ended up getting used um uh, it was probably just just trying to make it sound like something so we can get through the show and i don't really know uh how they actually used it and oh that's interesting what you know i really don't know all i know is that when we got it back the the knobs when you turn the knobs to different positions and they don't work because they're so dirty that when you turn the knob off its original position it stops working that's how you know where they had them set and if you, set them, if you set it like that it's unlistenable it's so bright you know that's so kind of scary that, that, that tells me that tells me either somebody set it that way and parked it after the tour because they actually got a chance to mess around with it and see what it was really capable of and decided eh, it's all right but yeah uh you know and left it that way for 10 years in storage and it froze <coughs> in, in that mode or yeah you know who knows who knows what i know is when i play it what i want to hear and and what i think sounds good and when you were playing it, we messed around with it to get it to where you thought it sounded good. And both of those circumstances, they aren't. And, and by the way, guys, when, when I was playing it, um, I didn't even ever touch a knob. I didn't play it that long. Um, Steve just kind of stuck a guitar yeah, well, in my I know hand. I know you're playing, so I sort of dial it in to work for you and your guitar. Yeah, he, he uh, kind of twiddled the knobs and I played. Um, I think there's a little bit here. Oh, that's that's all I had. Oh well, that was a joy. Well, there's probably another probably another one in there somewhere. Anyhow, let's so, let's hear uh, let's hear it in the room. Okay. And then uh, turn off my echo cancellation so we don't have that phasing issue. If I did that without the uh, attenuator on, it would be so funny. <laughs> I, I would hear it over here. You would. <laughs> That's the clean channel with uh, um, the volume up pretty high. So I'm actually using the power section. And this has got a, like I said, it's got 475 volts on the plates. It's hot. So um, 
I think it's a really funny thing. When I played it at the factory, when I first played it at the factory, Erica has been running around the factory going, you know, I've been hearing some music on the radio. And sometimes sometimes I'll hear a song. It doesn't matter if it's the 50s or in the 70s or whatever, but a record will have a hot sound. And That's I don't what she said about that amp. And I don't exactly know how to describe what I'm saying when I say that. It's just all I can, the only way I can describe it is it sounds hot. That's a and great when I started playing through this, yeah, you were there. She came back and goes, that's what I mean by hot. And I'm, you know, we're kind of, we're, you know, kind of trying to navigate that. So, but, um, without the attenuator on, it was just like, it was literally rattling the walls in the shop. And okay. so what I, so I've got the, I've got a power station too here that that's running into and then into the deliverance cab. And I've got the master volume or the volume because there's no master volume in the clean channel. I've got that up at uh, like mm, 12, one o'clock, which is where the power amp is starting to get hit. And then I'm turning the power station down so you can hear the power amp saturation. Now, if I turn the, the volume down on the clean channel so that it's not saturating into the power station, it would sound uh, much more, it would it would sound crispy, but it wouldn't have that what Jethro Skull described as the explosive elements. But uh, here's the thing. Here's flat. the thing, and here's my argument again for that particular amp: is any fool who's going to buy that damn thing, I'm one of them, is going to have a power station. I'm one of them too, and there's going to be certain things that I go. I know that I can get it to do that and a couple of things that I would like to do that it doesn't do now. So, but we wouldn't, if, if we did something like that, it isn't the kind of thing where I would just go, I'm going to make it this way and screw all you guys, because you're going to be there going, uh, Eric was going to be there going, I want the hot, you know? And so this is what I, this is what I contend with. I don't design in a vacuum like I did originally when this was built. I am open-minded to everybody's input because first of all, that's the way we work. Second of all, it's really valuable to get, you know, informed feedback from people around you about what they're hearing. So it, it, it shortens the development time by considering other points of view and having other points of view to consider that, you know, are founded in reality. Not just the guys going. It'd be great if I had a push button that, like, would uh, you know, like, would would blend my margaritas for me while I'm doing my soul. You know, the the silly stuff, which you just can't take seriously because then if you do, it turns into you know the Homer mobile, and and we don't want that. But what we do want is when <laughs> somebody at Homer mobile, right, right, Seventh Street Hammond. Don't listen to us too much. We listen. I listen for. Not what people are saying, but what they're reacting to. When somebody is reacting to something, when somebody goes doo -doo -doo, and they go, that's what I react to. I latch onto that. As I was talking about Blucher, look, you know, digging past what comes out of your face and what he sees behind behind the mask. That's what I latch onto. I look for the stuff where where you you struck a nerve with somebody and then you analyze what that was. Um, so this is this thing has a a three pin jack on the back to do the switching. It doesn't have any buttons on the front that you can pull or push to switch channels. So I've got this wire coming out of the back of that the the jack on that uh, the switching jack, so I can switch it into the lead channel, so you can hear that. And at, when I first did it, I, I and you were over there, and I was telling you, I, I don't think it has very much gain because it was so loud. I wasn't using the attenuator yet. It was so loud and so penetrating that you couldn't hear the saturation of the overdrive because the power amp was so dominant. Going through the power station, now I understand what you're saying by it. it's got all this gain because it does have a shit ton of gain. Um, and you, again, you absolutely need an attenuator to be able to, to navigate that or you're screwed. It's just like, you'll get, you know, the sound man isn't gonna just need to turn down. He's just gonna come down with an ax and just chop your power cord right off of your shit so they don't have to hear you anymore. <laughs> so can you, uh, 
Well, yeah. Deliverance cap. Okay, that does sound pretty gorgeous, I gotta admit. You okay, Joe? We good? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're having some, uh, at least on my end, some weird connection stuff. So, uh, we're cutting out? Okay, yeah, you're not frozen. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, let us know, guys, in the peanut gallery if, if it's cutting out on your end, but Steve's cutting out a bit on me. Um, do you see this question from Simon, Steve, about uh, the KT-88s? Um, yeah. Um, so going back in time, <laughs> um, The original power amp idea was going to be ADL 34s. This was before it was classic, before there was any company. It was just going to, I was going to make a power amp Only with ADL 34s, four per channel, 100 watts a channel. And uh, at the time, the tube industry was sort of in a state of flux. American manufacturers were shutting down. There were still tubes being made in the U.S. Uh, in the uh, 70s, up to the late 70s. And um, so there was all this what's going to happen next kind of attitude vibe. And EL34s at the time, there were a lot of difficulties with EL34s. It's why EVH was using 60A7s. It's why Mesa was using 60A7s in their amps that used those type of tubes uh, because the EL34s were just not holding up. It's why Marshall put 6550s in um, 
in the volume, the master volume series amps, warranty replacement issues with EO three fourths. So, um, at the time, sixty five fifties weren't that distinctly more expensive than EO thirty fours. They were pretty much in the same pricing ballparks. Well, of course, I'm not talking about EO thirty fours. I'm talking about sixty eight sevens. So a Sylvania 6CL7 was not a whole lot difference in price than a GE 6550. A few bucks, not, it wasn't double. So uh, I came up with the idea that um, our stereo power amp would probably, it prob the end user would be better served if it only had four power tubes in it instead of eight. It would be less expensive oh, to maintain. Yeah. So, uh, and mm -hmm. I knew that a pair of 6550s would put out 100 watts because they can, that's the, what they're designed to do. E uh, uh, Ampeg SVT power amp, six 6550s, 300 watts, 100 watts a pair. You know, that's just the way they work. So I just thought, well, this power amp would be awesome with two channels that were each a third of the output power of an SVT. And it could be made to sound like in the in the ballpark of an EL34, like we demonstrated the other day with the Sound City and the and the and the deliverance, you know, the things that you sort of associated with the two amps almost sounded like they were the opposite of things that you normally associate with the two different amps. And that all goes down to design intent, not necessarily how the tubes sound. So that's how I got into using the big tubes in the first place, was just out of a sense of economic relief, reliability relief, uh, end user um, cost of servicing, you know, uh, maintenance cost, uh, cost of ownership, like you would relate to on a car. How much gas does it use? How much uh, an appliance, a refrigerator, how much does it cost to operate over a year? And those, that's what was going through my head at the time. So um, then it just became a thing because the power amp ended up being so, so popular that it just became a thing. And then um, after a while, uh, GE ceased production of the 6550s. And those were the only good ones that were available at the time. And the, and the substitutes were woefully inadequate. Um, so, uh, we kind of, you know, hobbled along with what was, what was available and what was coming out and what was good and, and what was good was just barely good. And the whole thing, the whole market with tubes was in a state of transition and, uh, tubes that were coming out of uh, Czech Republic, tubes that were coming out of Russia, tubes that were coming out of China. Were they going to be any good? Were they going to be reliable? Were they, were they going to be consistent? Were we going to be able to get them year after year after year? And all these questions. So um, uh, somebody, I think it was um, Aspen Pittman, um, pitched to me uh, the Tesla KT88s. Uh, he said the 6550 thing is in a state of flux. We, I knew that. And uh, he said, we're working on a KT88 with Tesla that is going to be really good. So he sent me some samples and they were okay. They had some problems. I gave him a written report about the things that I had a difficulty with and needed to get addressed. And uh, they addressed those. And, and then I went, okay, so we can use those. And that's why we switched to KT88s in the, two, in the 2150 power. And then when we morphed into making the two nine the 2150 into a smaller two space rack which became the 292 then kt88s went in those just by default because we'd already made that switch and then uh um so the the, the classic power amp uh or the classic head became the clx head because um pb didn't want us to use the name classic on the amp anymore so we stopped doing that we changed it to clx and then uh, I had done an experiment with um, when I made the Nelson Pitbull, I made another one also using a, a 76 um, 50 watt chassis. I made one, instead of using 4L34s, I did it with two 6550s. And I thought it sounded really good. And I started throwing, playing it and showing it to people. And I was kind of getting nowhere with it, like I said before. And, uh, 
Um, but I went ahead and built a pit bull, a full blown pit bull pre-production sample of that with two uh, KT-88s in it. And I just thought it sounded fantastic. And we released mm -hmm. that as the Pitbull 100. Now, somebody asked, I think they made a comment on, uh, um, they made a comment on one of the other videos that one of the power station videos, somebody made a comment about that they had an early uh, Pitbull model that had uh, um, two kt 88 and what was that about? And that's what that was. It was called the Pitbull 100. It was a 100 watt amp. It only used two KT 88s, and um, that was the predecessor to the Ultra Lead. So we had oh. them out for a while, and still the KT 88s that were coming out were still not really reliable enough or good enough to really depend on in that application. So I changed when we went to the Ultra Lead. I changed the Ultra Lead to use four KT 88s just so that we would have that extra um margin of of safety for reliability purposes and then that's when page came along so that's the story of the kt 88s so then we got associated with like all these amps that use kt 88s and at first it was kind of like well, why would you use those that's a base amp too but it eventually became our sort of signature thing and then one of the first companies to copy us i went to germany and there was uh a prototype being shown in Germany by Engel of this thing called the Savage that had two KT88s in it, mm. and it had a it had a depth control in it. They'd lift they'd lifted a lot of stuff from the Ultra Lead, and I went, oh, somebody's latching onto this. That's interesting. And then yeah, more people started doing it. So then it became like just sort of a normal thing to do. But I think that we were the first to dare using one of the big bottles in in an amp that. You know that you want saturation out of and people didn't understand that um the saturation behavior isn't necessarily a feature of the tube it's a feature of how the transformer is and the gain stages and all that work together synergistically to create the overall how much saturation an amp has how much bounce it has how much sag how how stiff it is how forgiving it is all those kind of things they don't have as much to do with what power tubes are being used is how the holistic circuit is designed to behave. And um, so we were just like really early in, early, early uh, adopters, first adopters of big tubes in guitar amps like that using a lot of gain. And that's where that came from. There you go, Simon. High five, my man. Uh, okay, Steve, another quick question. Um, I think you can answer this quickly. It's from Corey. You see mm. this here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, audible signs of tubes needing to be changed. Um, the uh, man, my amp sounds like shit. I think I'll change the tubes. That's how yeah, it works for that's, me. That's, that's, that's how it works. That's how it works. You're gonna you're gonna beat those. You're gonna know it's gonna blow a fuse or it's gonna get really weak and 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 anemic sounding, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's what's going to happen. Otherwise, you're not going to hear anything. It's going to be fine for as long as it sounds fine. And it's going to be a couple of years at least. You don't have to go look for signs. A lot of, I get, a, I get that a lot. How will I know? You'll know. That's a great point. Y yeah. You just like, man, what the hell? How do I know when my tires need to be changed? You know, <laughs> when there's no tread left on them? You can see that, right? Or when your guitar, when your car feels like, when you go around a turn on a wet road and you go sliding across an intersection, yeah, probably time to change your tires. When you notice it, when it really impacts you in a in an obvious way, that's when. And if it doesn't impact you in an obvious way, you don't need to be too uh, too OCD about power tube maintenance. You just need to milk them for all. They're expensive, and right now there's such a um, such a deluge of demand in the tube market that the tube suppliers can't keep up. So they're kind of hard to get. So, you know, use them for all they're worth, milk them for every watt that you could get out of them before you even remotely consider changing them. They're not like strings. Don't change them because oh, I think I'm losing a little harmonic. You might just be losing your hearing. <laughs> People say, why does my amp sound different in every room? Let's talk about what's going on in every room. It's a different uh -huh. room. 
The voltage uh -huh. might be different. The club might be different. Carpets versus cement walls. Uh, How many people are floor, in the room? Wood floors versus carpeted floors. How yeah. many people are there? Whether or not your brother-in-law got arrested and you had to go bail him out of jail. Uh, somebody didn't learn their part. Um, you had a fill-in singer because the regular singer couldn't make it. Did you get to pee uh, before you hit the stage? You got in a car accident. You did, the food was crap. I mean, there's so many things that impact the playing experience. When you say, why does my amp sound different every gig? There are some amps that sound different every gig. The, amp, the more complex, the more sophisticated an amp, the more things can shift. Uh, in, in our amps that are all multi-features, there's a lot of voltage regulation going on in the inside to insulate the operation of the subtle parts of the circuit inside from the line voltage variations because there's so many subtle little tweaks that you can do on some of our amps that a, chain, a subtle change in line voltage can make everything behave a little differently. But most of the time, what makes your gear or your performance more comfortable or less comfortable from gig to gig is just state of mind. It's psychological. Yeah. It has so much less to do with your gear than you think it is. And I used to be the same way. I was just like, man, I nailed that solo last night and I can't even play my way out of a bag tonight. And that wasn't because my gear was different. It's because my attitude was different. My, right. my, right. my, uh, my physical being was different. I was tired. I was hungover. I had a fight with somebody in the band or uh, whatever. I mean, all kinds of things uh, uh, impact your ability to play. Maybe somebody else in the band is having a bad night and you just sound bad in relationship to the whole environment because somebody else actually is really the one that sounds bad and might not even be you. It's just you can't navigate it because it's so inconsistent. Somebody's playing particularly badly, all those kinds of things. I don't, uh, you know. I remember, I remember when, you know, the first probably almost a decade of playing live for me, I just really, really, really struggled with uh, stage fright. Just, I, I kind of, it was so weird. I was making my living playing guitar, but I kind of hated playing gigs <laughs> and I was playing gigs constantly, which, so, you know, that was mm. fun. But I just remember, you know, some nights like I could not get enough gain when it was time to solo and it was all yeah because I, I would look at my stuff like i have enough gain it was just like you're saying it was all in my head yeah um, hey js I, I, I want you to i want you to practice this exercise i want you to stop thinking about the inside of your amplifier for <laughs> three months i'm serious three months don't think about the inside of your amplifier in any way shape or form disengage from what might be happening inside the amp that is you are that's how you're going to learn that it's irrelevant what's going on inside there versus what you think might be going inside there. Because the reason you asked that question is because you hear people talking about these things in isolation. And we've had this conversation before. How do you know that the piston in your engine is still round? Well, it isn't perfectly round because it was hot. And so maybe the roundness isn't as round as it was when it was cold. Do you ever actually think that? Do you get around, sit around with people and talk about how round your pistons are in your engine? That's about as effective as talking about how well I know if my the capacitors, what capacitors, the power supply capacitors, the interstage capacitors, the decoupling capacitors, the cathode bypass capacitors, the coupling caps, the signal input caps, which capacitor are you talking about? And you can't answer that question because you don't know what different capacitors do what. And you don't need to because those capacitors are working with resistors, which are working with tubes and transistors and ICs and speakers and all of these other things. All of those things, all those parts in your amplifiers operate harmoniously together as a unit. So the minute you start trying to isolate something that maybe you should think about in the future might be going, that's the time to stop thinking about your gear and start thinking about, you know what, I should write a song. 
I should learn this solo I've been thinking about for years and haven't actually sat down and tried to learn how to play acoustically. Get out acoustic guitar and play the record and learn that solo that you've been talking about learning for all these years that you haven't sat down. Disconnect from all that. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to make your amp last longer. It's not going to make you happier. It's not going to make your playing experience any better. It's not going to make you a better player. Okay, but Steve? Yeah? How successful were you in heeding your own advice there? <laughs> this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So this is what's going to lead, right? I'm trying to yeah. save you from a lifetime of <laughs> That's agony. what I mean. You're, he's saying this with love because I'm sure Steve like spent way too goddamn much time worrying about what was going on inside his amplifier. Hey, uh, All right. my man, you can, um, you can have you can have 120 hertz hum in an amplifier and have nothing be wrong with it. So first of all, we don't know what amp it is. We don't know how much. 100 is that is the 120 watt hertz hum so omnipresent that you can't even play a note or is it just in the background where it normally is the, i thought i used to find I, the very first time i heard this was a, when i worked at valley arts some guy came in and um he had a mesa boogie amp and he was like in love with it but all of a sudden he started saying it's making this noise that the sound, when I play the sound, and it didn't do that before. And what was happening is he would play uh, a, di a dyad, a two finger dyad bending the two yeah, strings. Like a double up. stop. Yeah. A double stop. Thank you. And one day, he started hearing the ghost note activity in the amp that was already there from the very beginning, but he heard it in isolation for the first time. When he bent up the double stop, he could hear the ghost note. When you bend up a double stop, the ghost note will go down in the opposite That's direction. That's one of the greatest things that guitar amplifiers can do. And you play with that and make music with that. And that's yeah. what that is. He had never heard it out of his amp. And when he did hear it, he had surmised that he had heard it for the first time and that it never did it before because he couldn't unhear it anymore after that. It was right. always there. But it took a week of explaining, listening, phone calls back and forth to the factory, Ben Danelli, you know, driving him nuts. And he would call Ben Danelli, then he would call me, and then I would call Ben Danelli. We're like, we finally went, you know what? Tell this guy to just like live with it and stop listening because he's he's always going to hear some new thing. That's the feature of this amp. It does so many things, so many different ways. You're going to discover this amp does things that you never heard an amp do before. And it doesn't mean it's broke. It means it's a new thing for you. And yeah. I experience that. Every manufacturer of amplifiers experiences that when somebody gleans some little characteristic out of an amp that is foreign to them for whatever reason, it it, it may at first be uh, classified as a fault or a failure before it's just, it's a personality that rubs me the wrong way or I love it. I remember, you know, when I was when I was talking about, you know, the first decade of me playing and struggling with it, I remember one thing that kind of helped me get through that was to quit Love trying to be a, like a, a good player all the time. Like I need to have my gear act, behave the same in every uh, environment that I'm in so I can, you know, basically get my same shit off or whatever. And what helped me was when I changed my mindset to, Oh no, wait, like, Whatever my gear gives me on this particular night, my job is to participate in interacting with that and try and do something musical with it. And so yeah. it became more of kind of like uh, like playing a game with my gear than, you know, um, you know, damn it, it's not doing exactly what I want it to do so I can look good in this particular light that I always want to be seen in. And uh, it kind of released me a little bit and, and – uh, got me back to kind of like playing music rather yeah. than trying to demonstrate how good I was through music or totally well, here, different. Here's the, here's the thing. Uh, an, a, another factor that's going on these days, which causes the, which causes questions like this to arise. And the mm -hmm. issue is there are no longer really skilled 
repair people out there that can deal with this stuff. Hmm. There are very few and far between. So it drives the do I, the DIY mentality. I have to learn how to do it myself. And I'm telling you, it's a distraction like you would not believe. It's a distraction to your art. It's a distraction to your musical discipline. It's a distraction. It's a distraction for me. I have to, um, I have to manage it. I have to manage to like disconnect myself from it. Like right now, for example, uh, I wanted to show you the the classic platform that's sitting back here, and we wanted to talk about it a little bit. And I want to get to it before we get too far out in the weeds. Um, so I switched while Joe was talking. I switched to the other amp so that we could listen to it and. The clean channel in this one has a little bit of hum into it. So while I'm talking to you, I'm hearing the hum and it's kind of distracting to me. And I'm like, except I know why it's humming. I know why it's humming and I know that I'm not going to so be. So you could fix it. it. You could. I could fix, and, I, yeah. and I could have fixed it before. I, when I went to the shop today to pick it up, to bring it over, I could have put a shielded wire on there, fixed it, and I said, hell with it. I already know what it is. It's not going to make people go, I'm hearing a hum while you're playing. What the hell is that? Nobody's going to hear that. But... I got distracted thinking about it for just a sec because yeah. that's what I do. And one of the exercises for me is to, to not fix it. And, and then it will go away. It will, as, as uh, the former guy would say, it'll just magically disappear. <laughs> and it will. And you're going to think that, bugged the crap out of me the whole night. It affected how I played. I didn't solo as well. I turned in a lousy performance. I'm really down on myself. Man, I really, I'm never going to do that again. And the minute you walk off stage, five people are going to come up to you and go, man, you kicked ass tonight. That was the best solo that you ever did on that song. Man, it's really great to hear you get better at your craft because I'm watching you play better and better. Man, you were just like on fire tonight. That's awesome. That's happened yeah. so many times. I can't even tell you. I in used to contrast. Get in contrast I, to the night argument for people about it no i sucked sideways oh, right, right. No that's that's in contrast to the nights when you think you played like a god and you walk and off you stage and nobody said jack, jack shit did. yeah right nobody yeah. said jack shit what what you think my play tonight oh just like usual yeah you were great oh, yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah you were up there that was cool yeah <laughs> i saw that you were breathing so i figured you were okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> well <sighs> I'm not distracted by, by my art like all you real musicians. If I can properly devote my attention to the <laughs> minutia of my rig. <laughs> yeah, baby. Let me tell you. you know, another, another thing that got me away from doing that was actually witnessing gear nerds on stage playing their gigs. And you could just see them the being obsessed, obsessed with what was what coming out of their speaker cabinets and how lame that looked. It was like, okay. I swear I'm never going to be that guy again. Meanwhile, I'm perform music. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm at Nashville Nam a few years ago, and I'm walking down the main street with a couple of friends, and there's a bar. We walk by this bar, and the bandstand is in the front of the bar. And the, um, uh, the, the front of the building is glass. And so you're looking at the, you're looking at the back of the drummer in the in the window yeah and all the musicians are in front of him and you're seeing the back of all of them so sure. they all the whole band has their back to the front the glass in the front of the club as you're walking down the street yeah and you know they're all just and you're seeing you're just seeing the back of the drummer and his hands are doing this the guitar player starts soloing and he's got a cigarette in his mouth and he comes back and stands next to the drummer and starts talking to him with a cigarette in his mouth while he's just ripping out this incredible solo. He's tearing it up. He's not even watching the guitar. He's telling a joke to the drummer with a with a cigarette in his mouth. He's blowing yeah. smoke out his nose, and they're like, yeah, they're yakking and laughing while he's doing the solo. And then he wraps up the solo and he goes back and starts singing his backup vocal part when he finishes his solo. It was just so autopilot, but autopilot like he was blowing it just blowing on the guitar. It was just like, I'm looking at him going, I would love to be able to solo in a coma like that and not even think about it. My life would be sublime if I could do that. That, that to me was skill. Uh, you'd find something else to be miserable about. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I will find something else to bitch and moan about myself because that's <laughs> what we all do. Once you fix one thing, you got to go after something else. Yeah, right. Right. So uh, uh, you have the, okay, I can hear. It. Oh, no, no, no. Turn me on uh, anti-hum cancellation so we can hear that chrome-plated Pitbull prototype of Doom. I did turn on the cancellation. No, turn off. I turned off the cancellation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. A lot of gain. That's intense, dude. <laughs> yeah, that is the amp, man. There's no pedals there. <laughs> that amp, the clean channel has a pull bright, a pull boost, and there's a depth control, which... Um, I didn't start using the uh, rotary depth control at the very beginning of the prototype. When we started making the amps in production, we added that. Um, but it just had a two two presets of the depth control on a pull switch. So on the clean channel, the first thing I did was I pulled the depth switch in and out a couple of times. And then there's a boost on that channel. So I that in and out a couple of times on that. And there was a bright pull pot in and out a couple of times on that. So when it got really open and sparkly and clean, it was um, boost off and bright on. And then when it got chunky, it was bright off and boost on. Then I went to the rhythm channel uh, with the um, boost off. So, so it gave you kind of like the clean channel voicing only with more grit and more gain. Uh, but still not completely shredded out. And then I pulled the boost knob of the rhythm channel out, which added like 60B of gain to give it that really chunky thing. And then 
the channel has a shift control, a mid shift. So I pulled that in and out so you could hear it really bark or get more scooped out. And then I switched to the lead channel, which also has two pull switches. One of them. And then it got uh, real serious. One of them. Yeah. One of them is uh, pulling it turns, it turns on that gain channel and pulling the other one adds edge, which adds the, 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 crispness on the top and then i pulled the depth control out again to add to the bottom end and that's when it got with the full saturation mode with the drop detuning that's where it got the saturation and the edge and the bottom end thump all at the same time and that's why i kind of lightened up on the strings so you could hear all the strings sort of develop their like, sort of harmonic openness and start interacting with each other, the harmonics of the other strings. That's when it starts really sounding like a piano. Then once I had established that with the really high gain mode, I switched back to clean with that piano, piano like sort of setting so that you could hear. Basically, I went through all these steps, but sort of trying to maintain this sort of piano quality, super clean, boosted clean, boosted crunch, uh, unboosted overdrive and then full saturation got it and it's always been my attitude my my goal in the amplifier design and i think uh steven mentioned it um it was an it was a thing that i used to do um at the nam show with the sig x was show every channel going from clean to as overdriven as i could get for that channel and doing that same thing on each channel making each channel sound clean crunchy or as overdriven as possible until I was just completely fully saturated out and then back down to the clean mode to, to illustrate and demonstrate the transition, the transitional nature, which I have always talked about. And I always will talk about um, the transition of different stages of gain. You're not playing clean and then playing shredded out. You're, you're building dynamics in music and you want the amplifier to be able to respond dynamically as you things get more intense and then scale it back to where it's less intense so when you have an amp that doesn't transition well it gives you those three basic uh you know food groups the clean the crunch and the and the shred it doesn't give you any of the in-between stuff. And so basically you're forced to use pedals to navigate those in-between areas, a boost pedal, yeah. A, yeah. a lightweight distortion pedal, or a, a, a metal zone or something like that, to, <laughs> a, an amp that doesn't really do metal to get it to do metal. You know, that's what you're, that's what, that's how I, that's how I see pedals as band-aids to an amp that hasn't got the range that it could have if, if you designed it to have it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think um is is that what we were doing with this clip of me playing that amp? I think I think it's about what a we minute were doing, long. What we were doing with you playing, what I was doing was I was re remember when I told you that I needed you to come over and play it because I didn't yeah. couldn't remember. I when I played it, everybody just wanted to run out of the room. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's what was happening. It was like the, the previous day, I was playing through the Nelson Pitbull, and it was like, that's hot. That's awesome. That's great. The next day, I was playing through this. And I was like, would you just stop that, please? <laughs> because, one, it's a complete, real, completely realized amplifier that went out into the world. This other thing is a test platform. Yeah, the Nelson was the completely realized amplifier. Yeah, and the, and the, and the test platform needs to be massaged into behaving like something because there's all these possibilities and all these things that were really just sort of test functions. Do we need this? Does this work? Does this help the sound? Does this not help the sound? Blah, blah, blah. So I had to re-familiarize myself with those things. And I did that while you were playing. I sampled them as you were playing. And then when I pulled a switch, I went, oh, well, if we're going to have that switch out, then the treble or the mid has to be like this or else it's uh -huh. heinous, right? Uh, so that's okay. what I was doing. I was fleshing it out while you were playing. And then everybody's going, that sounds really good. What are you playing? We're playing. Through the, oh, that one? You're playing through the crap amp. Interesting. Yeah, playing through the crap. Yeah, the one that, that scared the daylights to everybody. Yeah. That's, that's what I, I was saying. I think we have about a minute of that here. I can play it. Yeah, do it. Do it.
Well, there was that. Man. Yeah, well, see, the, the, the thing that was going on, one of the things that was going on there is that I had you bring your guitar for two reasons. One is because it's not my guitar. I wanted to hear with a different guitar. Well, besides, I broke the string on your other guitar. Besides just why just besides that you're a different player, I wanted to hear a different guitar. And yeah, you you broke the string on the strat and I didn't have a spare. And uh, but it was just too it was it's a lower output pickup and it's pretty bright. Um it needs the power amp saturation to make it to make it sound work, to make it work and, and sound woody. So I was sort of learning your guitar through that amp on the fly and kind of trying the different functions and going, yeah, that works, that doesn't. Just like I did in the very beginning. Does this work? Does it? No, that doesn't work with that. And you need to do this, blah, 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 blah. And um, uh, that was that was what was going on when we would when I would take that amp around to stores and some and you know somebody in the store would like get hey let's get Bobby he's the the guitar wizard you know and so Bobby would come over and go I don't know and then hey dude just play just play let me get let me get familiar with your playing let me get in your head uh, I whatever I don't know what you mean by that but I mean he would start playing and then I would do something he would go hmm and then you start playing. He start playing something else. I go, no, play that same riff that you did a second ago. Play that again. Yeah. Uh, what did I play? Just okay, whatever. Just play. And he would just start playing. And then he would play this thing that he played before again. And then I could grab it and dial it. And he goes, Oh, that sounds really good when I play that. Before it didn't sound that good. Yeah, just give me a minute, all right? Just play. <laughs> just play. Just have fun. And then and then I get to do my magic, you know, my thing, uh -huh. which is just uh -huh. like what what works, what doesn't work, what works, what doesn't work. And and I did the same thing with you now. It's that's what is always going on. Yeah. But the the good part is when you get a sort of a, an essential design that will do a lot of that traveling without all that stuff going on. But at the time I was learning the craft, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I need I needed to have Ys in the road everywhere and go travel down them and like, oh, this road ends in a cliff. Okay, I'm not going to go any farther on that one. <laughs> this is what we learn in the journey of life. Um, and uh, yeah, so the 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 amplifiers that follow that naturally they get less dependent on those little. Features and the other thing, you probably I don't know if anybody noticed that while you were playing, while I was doing that, I'm kind of doing this with a knob to try to get it to pull out because yeah, the the um the chicken head knobs are rounded on the top, so you can't grab them and pull them right. So I had they to get my finger, ideal. I had to get my fingernails under the edge of the knob so that I could snap it out right, and that, <laughs> that was kind of like just the thing at the. It, in the t at the time that that amp was designed, that was just like what everybody did: pull pots, Mesa pull pots, Rivera pull pots, pull pots, pull pots. Sure. And um, but I didn't want to use those knobs. I didn't like the way they looked. Mm. So then I discovered that uh, that the pull pot thing isn't going to work with chicken heads, and that's when I went to the push buttons or the mini toggles, and that begat. If you can make a switch for this function, then you can also make a switch for that function, which begat the 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 sense the sensibility that it's those buttons and switches that are doing the thing that I like, yeah. not that the amplifier with me playing it is doing the thing that I like, and that was the realization that came to uh, the the birth of the deliverance. Like, okay, we're you know, we're we're shooting ourselves in the foot by playing this game with the players out there because they're missing the point, and we're enabling them to miss the point. So we got to pull it back, and the deliverance was the pullback. And then people got that. Now we can do. We can go back and revisit the the pitbull concept with a fresh uh, perspective, and. We've actually done that in a couple of things where the not the the amps that had all the buttons and all the switches, some of those things are actually still in the amp and and engage when you switch either the channel or you switch to the high gain mode. Some of those things 
they just naturally sound good in certain modes. So what we did was we just made it so that they engage automatically behind the curtain when mm -hmm. you switch channels. Yeah. Because we found that everybody that set the channel this way with that button in, well, we just made it so that when you set the channel that way, that button, that function engages behind the curtain. So, right, right, right. Uh, and there's just going to be more of that. The more skilled we get at refining what those little features and flavors are, get the amp to just do it on demand by the use of the guitar volume. Of course, what does that require? It requires players to get refamiliarized with the concept of using that little rotary twiddly knob that's on the guitar that makes the signal get hotter and colder. Right? That's, <laughs> it's a key that that restores the guitar volume and tone pots to their rightful place in the, I mean, you know, you, you watch, uh, um, change my uh, life. Well, you know, watch, uh, watch Santana at Woodstock and the same with, with Hendrix. They aren't just like skillfully and cleverly grabbing the tone, the treble or volume pot with their pinky finger, like all of the players that we admire that they're so slick at doing that. Hendrix is grabbing the knob on the top and looking right at it and going, eh, 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 eh. you can see him. He almost tips the guitar up and goes, Geek. and, and, and Carlos at Woodstock with his SG, he's leaning over the SG and he's grabbing the knob and he's turning it like he's trying to open a can of tuna. It's hysterical <laughs> the way these guys glom onto the knobs and they're trying to look at the number and seeing if they've got it perfectly between six and seven or whatever. They're really working that thing. Yeah. And not only are they working it, they're really aware of what they're doing because, oh, when I got it between six and a half and seven last night, that sounded really good. So I got to get it right at that spot again. And you watch them watch them. And they're like really focusing on the knob position and grabbing it in a funny way. They're not like, they're not being slick about it and like just, you know, gracefully, uh, you know, uh, what you're like, mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Mm, this mechanic, you know what's thing funny? One thing that you've never heard from Carlos, Alvin Lee, any of those guys who played Woodstock was commenting on, yeah, my tone was really whatever there. Mm -mm. That wasn't what it was about, right? I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan at the at the at the Ventura Theater years ago. What tour? Uh, it was well, it had to be. It wasn't that Jeff Beck thing. No, a couple of years before that. It had to be. Uh, yeah, it was two years before that. Oh, a year or two before, before he got that. sober, like uh... right after, right at the time. Oh, okay. Right where he's coming out and he's doing his rap about. So he was wearing his guitar higher by then. Yeah. And he was doing the he was doing the rap. Hey, I want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. He'd yeah. like play the song and then you turn the level down and go. Hey, I want to talk to you about something. Was it he would do like without the, you? I think, and he would break it down and do the rap. Something yeah. like that. He would do the Albert King thing. Yeah. Everybody has the blues. Even a little baby kicking and crying in a little baby bed, he got the blue. He was doing that, and okay. um, he had he had a couple of uh, he had a couple of blackface fenders. I think they were super reverbs, maybe and, um, spurs, vibraverbs. I forget what it was. Yeah, that, and he had the the uh, the 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 big dumble. This I think it was the steel string. The steel string singer slinger or, whatever. or whatever singer, yeah, yeah, which was actually the Dumbo preamp on an SVT power amp. So that's what that mm. is. Um, and uh, he was doing really good, but he was kind of struggling with his tone a little bit. And he went back to the fenders and tweaked the knobs a little bit, and it went south on him. And he was like, not sounded good, and you could tell he was not comfortable and uh the the person that i went to the show with is is named john kirksey he was a record promoter and he was promoting stevie Va ray Vaughan's latest record so we went down to see him and we went backstage 
and he introduced me to them to to Stevie Ray Vaughan, and we talked. And he said, "Oh, this is Stevie. He's a guitar player too. And he makes amps." And oh, cool. So we talked a minute, and I just said, "Hey, man, my heart really went out to you when you like you, you turned a knob and." I think you turned the wrong knob and you, you kind of like went down a bad road. And I, I really, I just saw what you did and I, and I couldn't do this, but if I could, I would have run up on the stage and turned the knob back. I think you just turned the knob, a different knob than you thought you were. And I just, I just, I just want, you to know, my heart went out to you. I, I've done that so many times. I just like, but aside from all that, man, it was really great to see you play and, and, and you play with conviction. So I don't even think you have to worry about it, but uh, it, just like, wow. You know, Guitar player wow. to guitar player, I did pick up on that. And he's like going, "Yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to leave the shit alone and play." <laughs> and, uh, nice meeting. I got to go do a meet and greet now. But hey, nice talking to you. And then he, off he went. And uh, but yeah, you you do that. You think I'm just gonna eh, eh, eh. after you've done a sound check, you've had the production crew, you've gone through all the stuff to get it just right, and then you get to the gig and you go bloop and it's wrong, and now you're fucked. And when you're when you're fucked, now you're distracted. And when you're fucked and distracted, and then you got to go around and try to figure out what you undid, but you got to sing a verse in a second. It's just well, like, yeah, that's exactly it's like what rolling I was down a cliff. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. When I finally witnessed somebody do that in front of me on stage, and you watch somebody kind of melting down and being completely distracted about, like it's, it's it's complete self-absorption is what it is and it's obnoxious as hell to watch yeah. you know yeah um, yeah whether or not you paid to watch somebody or not it's just super distracting and i just swore to never do that kind of thing again you know it's <laughs> it's about creating a vibe in the room right yeah yeah not right jake yeah I, I i if i didn't know you were goofing i could almost think yeah you're probably right Levon, uh, yeah, with Carlos. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Oh wow, in, Wayne! In you saw Stevie on every tour. Wow. Go down, go down, and look at Levin's message. Uh, nice to have you here. Thanks for sticking around. Hey, where in Russia are you, friend? I'd yeah. love to know. What city? Thank, thank you so much for tuning in. That's super cool. Um, man, and then didn't. I think you told me you saw him on the the tour with Beck, right? I did, and that was that was pretty interesting because a big Beck fan, you know, sure. and a big Stevie Ray Vaughan, Vaughan fan, mm -hmm. and I was really anxious to see what that was going to be like. Yeah, and just forget about the playing part because stylistically they couldn't be different sure it was obviously mutual respect there yeah and they both played their asses off and great the the outstanding re impression that i had my takeaway was that steve ray Vaughan's stage presence made him look like he was 10 feet taller than beck it was just like such a thing that when Beck is doing his thing, he's hunched over the guitar, he's doing his, meh, meh, you know, he's doing it. And, and Bozio's playing drums and he's remarkable, you know, just like, wow. He's really doing his part. Everybody's really doing their part, but they seem small and focused. And Steve Ray Vaughan comes out with the hat and the, the, the serape, and he just looked like he was, Bigger than everybody. Like Nobody a could really taller. compete with that. Right, right. It Do you was remember just stage presence. He just came out and wang a bang a big bam bam bam. It was all about groove and it was all about just feel. And it, he could have been, he could have been sawing the guitar in half with a razor blade, and it wouldn't have made a damn bit of difference because he was just like giving it. He was putting it out there, and it was awesome. And I just thought that's. If, if you want to do a video tutorial about what stage presence and charisma is, just play 30 seconds of that, and it's yeah. all Yeah, right. and that particular brand of it. I mean, yeah. it's it's one – I remember seeing the uh, – oh, what was the name of it? Oh, it was MTV Unplugged. 
Uh, and MTV Unplugged one time, they had a shared bill on the same show. It was Stevie Ray Vaughan and Joe Satriani. <laughs> and uh, I loved them both at the time. And St Stevie, like, I don't like to think of it as a competition <laughs> at all. Like, but Stevie just dwarfed Joe in every possible way. Um, and it's, it's just like an energy or a, a vi the visceral approach to guitar. I don't know what it is. Um, but I guess all I can say uh, in closing on that point is just like nobody should get up on stage next to Stevie. That's <laughs> going to be really, really, really problematic because he's <laughs> – I mean – I mean, what what would you call it? I mean, you you can't. I would call it being plugged into the universe, man. Yeah, because it's not like you'd you you could compare Jeff Beck and Stevie Ray Vaughan. They're both wonderful. Okay, both masters okay. of their individual expression. Same with Satriani. I saw, I saw a Jeff Beck group in uh, uh, sixty had to be sixty eight in Seattle at a fifteen hundred seat auditorium. That's awesome, by the way. And Ron Wood and Ian McLagan and 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 uh, and Rod Stewart. Mm -hmm. And in that show, Beck was plugged into the universe. Okay. Everybody else on the stage disappeared. No matter how much Rod Stewart was the focal point with the mic stand up in the air and the way he sang and all that and his the way he looked, the way he was dressed and blah blah blah. But nobody could nobody could touch Beck just holding the Les Paul up like this and going. You just you just whooshed, all your attention went right there. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It was his sound was great. His approach to the guitar was fresh and new, you know, there was that. But it was also the sensation that he had, he did that with no more effort than washing dishes when he got home. Yeah. It was just so, yeah, so what? Well, actually, actually when I think of that, that Stevie, Stevie Ray and Joe Satriani thing, like, Joe's thing does not translate to the acoustic guitar. Like if you think of what he was playing at that time, I think flying in a blue dream had just come out. And, uh, you know, I had live recordings of him at the time and he was so brilliant using feedback and just like, and his mm. band was killing does not translate to the acoustic guitar. He kind of came out and played a thing on banjo and, you know, whatever. And Stevie comes out and plays, like I think he played Pride and Joy on a twelve string, mm -hmm. just mop the damn floor with anybody, you know? Because I think you know what he was doing could translate to that guitar, mm -hmm. and it made sense. Where Joe is kind of like, I mean, surfing with the alien. That was like kind of doing a gig mm -hmm. as an alien, like so far removed from what he normally did. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Stevie like Hendrix playing blues on the that. twelfth string when Hendrix did that thing where he was just like in a room. That's by himself one of the on greatest school. things when he's yeah. playing "Hear My Train a Coming." Yeah, on that twelfth string, shit, yeah. shit. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what Stevie was go chasing. It's like I'm going to do that, <laughs> and I can do that, and you can. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, <laughs> cool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh hope you enjoy St. Petersburg. Isn't it isn't St. Peter P didn't St. Petersburg used to be named Leningrad? Is that the I one? I thought it was, it? yeah. Yeah. Um uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to look it up and see what it was. So I, I yeah, I'd kind of be interested in, in where where you're at now and moving. Are you moving for a job or is it a, a better city to live in or what I'm I'm real I've always been curious about Russia. There's always some crazy stuff going on there. There's always some crazy stuff going on here too, so I'm not really saying anything other than it's just like a different place where crazy shit goes on, and you're like, "Yeah, exactly." Geez, what's behind all that? All over yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's the th right. same thing about same thing with amps. You know, when I was first getting into amps and stuff, and I was opening them up, I was opening up Fenders and 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 Silvertones and 
awards the airlines and they all had a smell. And man, when I opened the first Marshall, it's like, wow, you could tell this came from another place, a totally different geographical location because it had a totally different olfactory signature. And um, it's really funny. The, the, um, we were talking about the construction of the of the um, of the Nelson Pitbull that I did it on a Marshall chassis. Yeah. It still has that smell in it. Uh, Amplifiers from different countries smell a different way. That's it's cool. cool. I like it. Uh, let's see. I found a new old stock Pitbull Ultra Lead in Russia, which is now sold to me. Fuck yeah, by former Russian dealer. It was my sweet dream amp for a long time, and we'll never part with it. Awesome awesome that's so cool oh did you get it from that did you get it from that um um yeah then tell tell me who the who the seller was i think i know it is is that guy that guy that used to come to the nam show that real stiff looking guy with the glasses that would go so stevie now that when when the pedal came out, when the when the SAS pedal came out, this guy from Russia with this really square outfit came up to do an interview. He goes, "Mr. Steven, so now that your pedal hatred is over, can you describe to us what is the design intent behind this new uh, uh, SAS pedal?" Now that and I'm like, "My pedal hatred is over. What? Where are you getting this stuff?" <laughs> That's a good and one. It's just crazy how this stuff translates but dimitri dimitri thank you yeah yeah that's the guy yeah yeah you know that that's, he's laughing because he knows that that's the guy he looks like he, he looks like a, a guy that would be like um um uh an extra on uh on dragnet you know like some character that's just so square and uh, stiff around people is like but making a big effort to try to like hang with the guys, you know, but it was like talk about a square peg, you know, I mean, sweet guy. I liked him. We, we, we got along really well, but he was really hilarious. He would say these, just say these things. He would pull these things out of his ass and go, now that your, now that your pedal hatred is ended. I'm like I never hated pedals. <laughs> like Actually, Steve, you kind of maybe do. Uh, no, I don't hate pedals. I hate the concept that they're going to fix something that's wrong with your amp. That's not going to happen. And it definitely is not going to happen for me because to my attitude is if the amp can't get you 98% of the way there, what is a pedal going to do to fix that? It's going to give you make it tolerable. Steve, come on now. You know what it's going to do. It's going to allow you to satisfy your your uh retail therapy uh issues at a lower cost price point than buying new amplifiers all the time just ask everybody on the gear page they'll, they'll tell mm -mm. you mm -mm. Mm -mm. come on you want 10 versions of a tube screamer mm -mm. Mm -mm. i want <laughs> yeah me neither i've so many times somebody has brought in this is the best boost you've ever heard this is the best overdrive you've ever heard and i plug it in so what i would do is i'd set up a sound that i like and then i'd listen to the sound of the pedal and then i'd dial in the amp to sound like the pedal to the point where i'd switch it back and forth and and the guy would say wow they sound really close except when you switch to the pedal it sounds more dynamic no, I'm switching to the amp. That's what sounds more dynamic. What? Wait, wait. I just, no. Oh, here, play it yourself. Mm. That's weird. I've never heard of that ever, that the that somebody would think a pedal was more dynamic. I mean, that's that's the first it's thing you know. he wanted to hear it that way. Yeah. It didn't really sound that way. He wanted that to be the case. And mm -hmm. when I had to demonstrate him, no, that's not the case. All you did by in introducing the pedal was save yourself the effort of dialing in the amp so that it would do that, you know? But I think mm -hmm. that there's there's still this long standing thing where a guitar is a thing as an instrument that's associated with a craft and that the amplifier is an appliance. And when the amplifier is an appliance, then the pedals 
become the devices that you connect to the appliance to make the appliance sound good to you. And I've always rebelled against that concept that the amp is an appliance. To me, the amp is every bit a craft in a pursuit of excellence as a guitar. You sand wood, you cut out body blanks and neck blanks, whether CNC or on a pin router, you glue everything together, you sand it down, you put a nice finish on it, you put in some pickups, a bridge, intonate it, make sure that the frets are nice. And, and if you know anything about the relationship of a neck to a body and how a neck, how the wood on the neck <laughs> behaves, and how the the body behaves and that when you put them together, if you put the wrong neck on the wrong body, it's going to sound like crap. And if you put the right neck on the right body, it's going to sound great. Dan Armstrong. I have a long stand. I had a long standing, really close friendship with Dan Armstrong. And he was a guy that I, we just got to be really good friends and compadres. And we could talk to each other in these sort of, uh, you know, esoteric terms because we understood what each other was saying. Sure. And whenever I would think of Dan, I I wonder what Dan's doing today. Whenever I would think that, he would walk in the front door of my shop like five oh, minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. And one day he came in and he had a body blank and a neck blank. And he goes, Stevie, I want to show you something. Listen to this. And he would hold up the neck and he would bang on it with his knuckles. And then he would put it down and he would hold up the body and he would bang on the body with his knuckle. And he goes, did you hear that? And I said, yeah. What did you hear? And I said, it sounded like an interval of a fourth to me. He goes, mm. exactly. That's it. Yeah. If it's a fourth or a third, it isn't gonna suck. It's gonna suck when you put them together. But if it's a fourth, that's what you gotta have. They have to be an interval of a fourth. And I'm like, wow. I eventually heard somebody else say that. It might have been Tom Anderson, I forget who. But he was the first guy that told me that there was a a, a musical interval that was uh, the, the the right musical interval was the relationship. No, I I, I, I actually I spent time going down that rabbit hole when I would oh, take yeah? strats and I would trade out necks and I would do that whole thing too. And um, it's I don't, I'll be damned if it didn't hold a little bit of truth. I mean, it's it's a it's a piece of the puzzle. I mean, you know, none of my guitars that I own these days I have done that with. You know, I, I guess in a way I've gone the route that you have gone, Steve, in the sense of, you know, if the guitar doesn't light up in my hands when I first play it, like I don't need that guitar. I just mm -hmm. want it as a holistic expression yeah. of whatever the builder wanted to do. And that's how I play it. I don't change pickups. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything mm -hmm. anymore. But there was a time. Mm -hmm. Um so should we wrap this one up or do yeah let wanna... me just let me just answer modern vintage right, about right. and so let me just say i want to say two things i want to talk about the fame for a second i want to talk about the ultra bleed for a sec we right. already shot our fat mouths off at the 2020 nam show telling people that we we're going to do the ultra lead and we are going to do the ultra lead i don't know what day what month it's going to be it's going to whether it's going to be within this year by the end of this year or, or ready to be introduced at the beginning of, of January 2022. I don't know because everything is unknowable right now, but we are definitely doing it. I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know exactly how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to express itself in, in final form. I think a big part of this show is illustrating going back and getting our heads wrapped around the, the stuff that's relevant to all that and that it basically saved me from weeks and weeks of doldrums and being and, and being down on myself wondering what the fuck am I even doing on this planet? It's sort of re revitalized all my juices. And so that's definitely on the horizon, but don't call up your dealers and start nagging them because they don't know shit about it either. And they don't know any more than we do. All we know is we promised it and we're going to deliver it. That's number one. Number two, one of the salient things to kind of keep in your head about everything that I've played tonight and tried to demonstrate with you is being done with the feigned speakers that were only recently created for our for us and within relationship to the use of our amplifiers. It's important 
to say that this was the vision for speakers I had all along, going way back to the very beginning, trying to work with Thane to get the speaker the way I wanted it, trying to work with Celestian, trying to work with Eminence to get the speaker the way I wanted it. And it took until just 2015, 16 to get it. And now what you're hearing, the, you're hearing these sort of relics for the first time and going, there's some really cool stuff going on there. You never would have heard that with the other speakers. I never heard it with I hadn't even thought of that before. Until just this week, right? Right, right. I didn't think about it until just the other day. I went, you know, I got to bring this up to Joe and we got to talk about this tonight. This is like, this is actually, this is actually the speakers that were originally envisioned for the whole thing that never existed at the time and didn't exist until just relatively recently. So we're all re-exploring this whole relationship of what these ants are, what they're capable of doing, what people will like and not like about them with finally the speakers that I was, that were in here the whole time, but never existed out there. So I'll leave you guys with that little parting thought because that's really, that's that's where I live and breathe. That's like the kismet, the thing coming together finally after 30 years of screwing around. It's like, oh, oh, and by the way, now it's actually doing what it was always intended to do that we could never put yeah. that last piece of the puzzle together. Yeah. Thank you guys for hanging out. It's been really exciting and fun tonight. I feel really, Joe and I both have been having a lot of fun the last few days and and uh, get and and getting into it and like finding interesting things to talk about, even not not knowing what we were going to talk about or what what relevance it would be to anything. It's just it was just been the week has been a journey, and we've discovered so many things. And and uh, um, I guess I guess that's what we do. We we go we go down these paths, and we talk to you about stumbling through the dark and like tripping over buckets of urine and going, yeah, we should, we should not do that again. And, and monkey vomit. Don't and forget that. Vomit. Yeah. 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 Hey, uh, so guys, I, I think there are some other questions up top that we didn't get to. Uh, we'll go through those and make a list and, and we'll make sure that we answer the pertinent ones next time. Is there, uh, is there an easy one that we can grab that somebody has been waiting a long time? Oh like man, third, I remember like the third episode that we haven't addressed something. Uh, uh, we'll probably get a del deluge right now, but um, yeah. Um, I, I want to go back through and make sure that we get to those next time. Das uh, we, Yeah, we talked. We talked about. Uh, uh, is oh, this is a good one. Let me just address this. This is Michael Chambers. Is there a unity concept in on presence and depth? Yes. At the time that I originally designed these things, there were two different companies that were ex experimenting with um, 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 uh, a, a function of an amplifier called... Uh, um, A damping factor. And a, the damping factor is the ability of the power amp to control the behavior of the speaker. It's a, primarily a concept applied to stereo amplifiers to make sure that the speaker excursion is under control so that the speaker doesn't color the sound. So generally, higher quality solid state power amps with lower impedance generally have a higher damping factor, which means a higher, better ability to control extraneous movement of the speaker when it's reproducing sound okay so rivera was experimenting with with damping factor and and seymour duncan those convertible amps they had a damping control in them and i studied those because i had been studying damping damping factor in stereo amps for some time and i sort of understood the concept and i'm like oh these guys are doing that uh cool what i was hearing though was not related to damping factor. it was but it wasn't I wasn't trying to get the power amp to control the behavior of the speaker. I was trying to allow the speaker to be a little bit released from the control of the amplifier without raising the damping factor of the amp. In other words, 
Let's control the bottom end. Let's make sure that it's not flubby, but make sure that we can enhance the resonance of the cab when we want to. Uh, and that's what the depth control became. Interestingly, the depth control, I envisioned it as just a low frequency version of the presence control, which is what it is. The depth control controls the negative feedback and the low frequencies and the presence control control increases or decreases the, the the negative feedback in the power amp in the high frequencies. And we've discussed feedback, so we don't have to go through all that. But what I was looking at was just to being able to control or set to your preference how much this low end resonance on the speaker cab would be appropriate to your playing style without making the bottom end flub. And I called it depth because I didn't want to call it something like resonance because I thought that was too sort of esoteric of a word. So I created this control and I named it depth and we put him in our power amps and we put eventually put him in our heads. And I thought I could patent this, but I don't know if anybody would really want to buy it. It's kind of a weird concept and it's a, probably a little too esoteric and who knows? I don't know. You know what? I think I'm just going to put it out there in the, in the public domain it's, and maybe somebody will like it and they'll do it on their amps and maybe I'll get credit and maybe I won't. Who cares? The point is we did it first. And when people ask us, we know exactly what it's about and how it works and how it can be modified and used in different amplifier models. Well, so that's how, um, that's how the concept between the depth control and the presence control are unified because they both operate in two different frequency ranges of the same circuit in the amplifier to do basically the same thing in two different frequency domains. All right. Then a couple of years later, I was really surprised when we were checking out something else that we were going to patent that PV had patented the resonance control two years. They had filed for the patent. So there was a patent application entered in 1992. So fully three years after we had introduced it into the marketplace as public domain and their patent was awarded. They didn't cite our amplifiers when they filed for the patent. And I heard that, well, it's because they didn't really know you existed. You were such a small company. No, they knew we existed. Here's how I know. They had the 2150 power amp at 5150 studio when they were developing the 5150 power amp, which was their first product to use the resonance control. And secondly, partly he knew, knew enough about me to send me a, a cease and desist letter in 1992 telling us that we have to stop using the name classic on our amplifiers. So he knew and they knew and they patented it anyway and took credit for it, but they actually didn't get credit for it because we did it first. And uh, I just like getting that in there because they shouldn't be unne unnecessarily and improperly credited for something that they didn't invent just because they got a patent on it. Could launch, anyway, the, holy, could launch the holy hand grenade for that one. Uh, yeah, launch the holy hand grenade. The, and and, and essentially, the number thou shalt count. Essentially, the now the counting shall be three. The patent is expired. And they never went after us for using it, which means that they knew that they couldn't win a case if they did try to come after me. And that's all I'm going to say yeah. about it. Thank you very much. Now let's now let's uh, go let's out with the joint. holy hand grenade. What? Are we blowing this joint? Yeah, we're blowing this joint. See you guys. Love y'all. Yeah. Thanks for coming and hanging out. See you again soon. Hand grenade. Hand grenade.